Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Um, thank you for joining us for this uh, afternoon plenary session. I hope you had a nice lunch and you're all well awake for the next uh, part of the program. Um, today's plenaries is titled Artemis, the new era of lunar exploration has begun. The panel will discuss how technology supports continuous human and robotic presence on the moon focusing on the beginning and also on the future of the Artemis program. Panelists will address the program's scientific achievements and plans for human-led research on the Moon and Mars, assisted by robots as well. Leading this panel is Najud Merancy, Strategy and Architecture Lead at the Exploration System Development at NASA. Please give her a warm, a warm welcome. And to welcome the rest of the panelists, please uh, join me in welcoming them. So 
Thank you for joining us here today. Uh, there will be a Slido app for questions, so we will take those throughout uh, and then answer uh, questions that come in through the app. Uh, the QR code is on the screens. Uh, so to begin, um, this is the panel on the new exploration, new era of lunar exploration that has begun. In the early morning hours of November 16, 2022, the massive space launch system core stage and solid fueled boosters erupted into life to launch the first of human-rated spacecraft to the moon in over 50 years. After a series of perfectly timed burns, the uncrewed Orion separated from its SLS and two hours later put itself on a path to lunar orbit. This marked the beginning of the Artemis program and ushered in a new era of space exploration. And this is just the beginning. Artemis I was a series, the first in a series of increasingly complex missions that will enable human exploration to the moon and Mars. The primary goals for Artemis I to were to demonstrate the Orion the Space Launch System rocket, exploration ground systems, and all of the support systems across the ground, air, and space flight environments. These goals culminated in, in to ensure a safe reentry, descent, and landing and recovery of the Orion spacecraft to prepare for Artemis II and our first crewed flight. This panel will talk about what we learned from Artemis I and some of the lessons that will inform our future missions. This plenary will also discuss the balance of the Artemis program and how future exploration objectives will be achieved. We will talk about how the global lunar utilization where government, private sector, and academia can maintain robotic and human presence on the lunar surface and the panel will also touch on Artemis science, one of the foundational elements of our exploration. So what we can do on site between robotics, human explorers, on and around the moon and Mars, and aided by all of the systems that all of the international partners bring. So join me in welcoming our panelists. First, Mr. Jim Free. Thanks, Najud. Uh, thank you very much. Good afternoon. It is uh, very exciting to be here. I, I have uh, fond memories of November 16th and December 11th. <laughs> uh, great, great memories. So uh, could I have the next slide, please? Uh, our, our first mission, as Najud talked about, um, let me go back to the title of this, plan this panel, is that exploration has begun. This isn't about a paper program any longer. It's not about uh, PowerPoint briefing slides and things we want to do. There's things we have done and we're on a near-term path to do, which is the greatest thing. That began with Artemis I, uh, tremendously successful mission, some of which uh, Najud highlighted. Uh, th these three pictures tell it all to me. A uh, launch of a first-time rocket, incredibly accurate uh, precision, um, perfect operation of a spacecraft in orbit, and then a great return and recovery, which is uh, the tremendous first step that we needed on this international exploration effort. Go to the next one, please. Um, so high level, um, we'll get into some details hopefully in the questions, but these are our series of missions that build on each other. Uh, I love the way this chart is structured. Um, our first uncrewed mission to really test our systems top to bottom, our crew transportation systems. Also an international mission, we had international contributions uh, in the European service module, a number of uh, CubeSats that were international as well. Moving with confidence to our second mission where we'll fly humans for the first time uh, back to the moon and the, f the vicinity around the moon. Uh, tremendous crews already been named. Moving from there with that confidence that our life support systems work well to our first landing and then getting into a steady cadence of missions uh, where we'll uh, do our landings from our gateway, our lunar orbiting station. So an incredibly exciting time uh, for us in the missions that we have, incredibly exciting for the science we're gonna get, and also in the international cooperation that is really the foundation of what we're doing for lunar exploration in Artemis. Thank you. Hi everyone, it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, my first time in Baku, it's been an amazing experience so far. Uh, so I want to tell you, next slide please, Nijun, uh, about the science 
on Artemis I and then the subsequent uh, Artemis missions. So as you will see over here, for NASA's Moon to Mars objectives, uh, science plays a, a center key role uh, in everything uh, Artemis, and you'll see that on the next slide that even though, as Jim just mentioned, Artemis I was really the mission that was going to ensure that SLS did its job, that Orion came back safely. Um, but in spite of that, science is so front and center that we actually had 15 uh, science payloads on Artemis I. There were five, as you can see on the left side, which were inside the Orion capsule that went around the moon and came back. And then there were 10 others that were these CubeSats that launched a secondary payloads. Uh, and what was uh, good about this mission is that it tested that capability of sending secondaries to do additional science to orbits that they otherwise may not have been able to get to very easily. And with the, I don't know if the yellow asterisks are clear enough or not on the slides, but there were at least five of these experiments that were international collaborations. So again, partnerships and, and, and several of them that had uh, industry or commercial partners. So again, partnership is a big part of the science uh, that we've been doing. Um, at the bottom middle, you can see bioexperiment one. And that was an experiment that uh, our division, uh, Biological and Physical Sciences Division in NASA, had uh, four experiments in that payload. And the Artemis group actually um, did an amazing job of returning our science to us seven days after return, which was earlier uh, than we expected, which is fabulous for the science because for some of these samples, uh, having them uh, returned to the investigator's lab ASAP is extremely important for the science integrity. Uh, so we're very excited and the investigators are working on that uh, mission, uh, on the experiments. This slide uh, is just to show you that, you know, we already talked about science in Artemis I, and the plan is that as we go on to the, the subsequent Artemis missions, uh, there will only, we expect that there will only be a growth in the opportunities to do science. And uh, a couple of uh, things that I wanted to point out here for the investigator community, uh, particularly, particularly the international investigator community, as well as the industry and commercial uh, side of it, uh, you know, there are various opportunities. There's the Artemis III geology team that was selected that will be uh, doing work. They will be preparing for the mission as well as monitoring in real time as the, the, the sample collections go on. There are also opportunities for deployed instruments, and there are calls for these, uh, which, again, uh, uh, partners are, are welcome to participate in those. Next slide, please. Oh, and then on this slide, what I didn't mention is Gateway uh, already has several uh, um, uh, experiments that are uh, planned uh, to go, and there are, many of them are actually international collaborations. So now I want to shift gears here on my last slide to the CLIPS landers. So uh, I talked to you about the science on Artemis up to now. CLIPS is another very useful platform for doing science on the moon. Uh, one, in fact, additional factor with CLIPS is uh, that they can take your payload to any part of the moon. Uh, previously, when I was talking about the Artemis payloads and experiments, uh, we're focusing on the South Pole. But with the CLIPS uh, landers, you can actually go to other places in the moon. Uh, and then the second point I wanted to make on this slide is that, and CLIPS, of course, stands for Commercial Lunar Payload Services. Uh, it is explicitly for doing science on the moon. Uh, these are commercial service providers who have platforms that can take your science to uh, space. In fact, I know several representatives of the CLIPS community are here. I had lunch with, with a few uh, earlier today. Um, and so anyone is able to approach and work with these providers to get your science on the surface of the moon. Uh, and with that, I'll stop and hand over. Okay. Uh, I'm Hiro Sasaki, Vice President of JAXA, in charge of human space flight and space exploration. Uh, I'm very, uh, it is my pleasure to be here and to attend uh, this 
a plenary session. And uh, uh, I will explain the JAXA role in Artemis program. Uh, for Artemis 1, uh, we, we don't have a, a contribution on the system of uh, SLS and uh, uh, Orion, but uh, we prepared the two CubeSat on the SLS, and uh, Omotenashi and Eclipse. Uh, Eclipse is, is uh, uh, flying smoothly for a long time and uh, conduct the demonstration of the technologies and also uh, collecting the science data. And, uh, and uh, we, uh, JAXA also uh, con uh, conducting the development of the two uh, missions on the uh, lunar surface. One is uh, SLIM and the other one is uh, RUPEX. SLIM, is, uh, SLIM uh, means a smart lander for investigating moon uh, was launched uh, successfully uh, last month and uh, now uh, it's flying uh, smoothly towards the moon and uh, landing will be uh, held uh, uh, next, uh, early next, uh, next year. And the uh, LUPEX uh, will be, uh, is a joint mission with uh, ISRO. Uh, ISRO was uh, uh, conducting the good uh, landing successfully and uh, we uh, pre prepared the rover and uh, ISRO prepared the uh, landers and it will collect the data for the water resources on the South Pole region on the moon. And uh, next chat, please. And also, uh, we are, uh, we are planning to participate in lots of uh, activities on our Artemis program. First one is uh, Gateway. Uh, JAXA uh, is developing and preparing to uh, provide the uh, ECLUS system to the IHAB and also provide, uh, developing the HTV-XG for to resupply uh, the cargo to the gateway. And the next one is a uh, crude pressurized rover. Uh, it, it will be, uh, JAXA now is studying with uh, Toyota Motors to, uh, to uh, contribute to the lunar surface activities. Uh, th this will uh, be, uh, uh, the crew will be uh, mm -hmm. about in without a uh, space suit and uh, it uh, contribute to the uh, sustainable lunar explorations. We also are uh, conducting the several uh, missions uh, preparations uh, such as uh, navigation and uh, communication and also uh, transportation on the moon. Uh, we will, uh, uh, we hope we can uh, contribute to the Artemis program from now. Good afternoon. Uh, first of all, thank you for the invitation for this uh, planning session. My name is Miguel Bellomora. I'm the director of the Spanish Space Agency. We are, you know, we start operation in April. We're only five months old. We're probably the youngest space agency in the world today, but in spite of that, space activity in Spain started a long, long time ago. In particular, lunar exploration started in the 60s with the agreement between NASA and Spain to put a deep space network antenna in Fresnadillas, close to Madrid. And, uh, well, the very famous picture of the Earth, the very first one of the Earth taken from the Moon, was received in, in Madrid, and also the Apollo 11 descent data was received in Madrid for the Apollo missions. And uh, since then, we have been working in lunar mission. We were actively working on the SMART-1, which is a European mission, an ESA mission to the Moon. And we are highly interested on science and instrument, but also in the technology in the lunar vehicles and spacecraft. There are we contribute to different uh, parts of the Artemis program. In the Gateway, we contribute in the SPRIT module, we contribute in the IHAP, we contribute also to the European Service module. Next one, please. Um, we have two avenues of collaboration in Artemis. There's one through ESA, through the European Space Agency, another one bilateral with NASA and with US companies. For instance, we are doing the power system or the IHAP for ESA, but we do also the power system for the HALO NASA through an agreement with US companies. We also are looking the docking systems, and we are looking also communication antenna for the different modules. Next. On the European service module, we are responsible for the thermal control. 
please. And uh, for the next future, for the, our contribution to Artemis in the future, uh, we look for areas where our industry is very capable, in particular guidance, navigation and control, scientific instruments. We are providing scientific instruments for mass exploration. All um, uh, uh, NASA rover have some Spanish instrument or meteorological station, uh, different type of instruments. We also are specialists in power and thermal control systems, advanced robotic and autonomy. Also in situ resource utilization. We have some, some uh, capabilities in this domain. And in particular, we are going to plan in small orbital mission with small sats, uh, rover, and as I said before, thermal control. Those are the lines of future activity of Spain within Artemis program. Thank you. Thank you, all of you, Jim Sharmila, Sasaki-san, and Miguel. So the first question, uh, so to Jim. With the completion of Artemis I and the development of hardware already underway for subsequent missions, how are the lessons learned in Artemis I impacting these future missions? So Artemis I, as I mentioned, was really to test the systems as much as we could before we put crew on there. And, and I'll say, I think the lessons learned activity uh, wraps up this month, but um, we looked at lessons learned all across the board from technical to all the way through how do we communicate with the public during the mission. And uh, from a technical perspective, the, the things that we've learned, uh, I'll point out one that we're uh, still working through the final disposition on is the heat shield. We had a very unique re-entry uh, that we've chosen to give ourselves a lot of cross-range capability to land where we want to land um, with, uh, with the crew to avoid weather. And that has a skip entry where we enter, enter the Earth's atmosphere and then actually skip out and skip back in to, to give us more of that cross-range. Um, that puts a lot of demands on our heat shield and uh, how the heat shield behaved uh, from a temperature perspective was, was very good. There's some other uh, mechanical ways that it behaved that we're working through the final disposition of that. Obviously, that will inform every mission going forward, how we do the skip, how we do our reentry. Um, so I'd say that's probably the biggest lesson learned uh, across the entire program. Um, and I, I think uh, the other thing uh, that I'll point out uh, that's different for two, so I talked about we tested everything we could. We've added a lot of hardware um, for two for the crew, right? We didn't have displays. Um, the Commander Munikin Campos that was in there didn't need any displays while he was on one. Um, and uh, we, you know, hand controllers so the crew can control the vehicle, a lot of life support systems. So they'll be learning on every mission that we, we do. Two will take a stepwise approach through it where we'll um, go into a 24-hour Earth orbit and test everything that we can before we commit to go to the moon. Um, so what we're actually doing testing within the test mission and taking things uh, stepwise. And then for future missions, we'll start to add hardware. For Artemis III, we'll have our lunar lander, we'll have spacesuits. Um, those are in development today. Uh, Gateway uh, that's been mentioned, I think now by all of us, has, uh, uh, is in process today, the, the logistics uh, outpost actually had its final well done today in Italy, I was told earlier. Um, and so all that hardware is de de in development and we'll continue to add uh, to each one, uh, each one of the Artemis missions. And as I said, Artemis 4 on, we'll base all our landings from, uh, from Gateway. Um, with our focus on, on science, Sharmila talked about uh, the, the science that we're going to be doing. That is completely our focus. We're putting humans up there to do science. We'll also learn how we behave in partial gravity. That'll help us as we go on to Mars. All right, so Artemis isn't the only lunar mission that's occurred recently. We've also seen the success of the ISRO uh, Chandraya 3 lander. Uh, Sasaki-san, since JAXA is also planning a joint lunar landing mission with ISRO, any lessons or, or takeaways you've had with that excitement? Yeah, um, first of all, the, the landing of the Chandrayaan 3 was a great accomplishment of the, for humankind as it is successfully landed near the South Pole region uh, of the moon, uh, which is the main uh, uh, setting for the uh, Artemis program. And uh, as I told, uh, uh, we are currently developing a rover uh, with uh, uh, ISRO, and uh, we are welcome to ISRO has uh, increased the certainty of the development of the lunar lander. So 
But uh, first, I would like to uh, follow India's successful landing in that stream. This was very exciting. So the first one near the South Pole uh, for us to lean on. Uh, so Sharmila, and speaking of science, with uh, Chandria 3 has been working on, the lunar scientists are also very busy right now, and the Artemis 3 geology team uh, was just selected. Um, we also have analogs for learning. So how do you see analogs fitting in as we get closer to crude missions? Yes, Najud. So analogs I see as being very important for science and for investigators to use as platforms uh, before you launch your mission to uh, deep space. And so uh, analogs that we've been using traditionally come in two flavors. You have the physical analogs, so for example, sites on Earth that have dry, arid um, conditions and rocky conditions where the dust and the rocks uh, uh, composition can be similar to that in the moon. Uh, and then you can use analog uh, uh, stations like that for training crew as well as testing equipment like rovers, etc. So that's one kind of analog. The other kind of analog that we also use that's very uh, helpful as well are operational analogs. So this would be, uh, uh, you know, where you can recreate some of the elements of spaceflight, whether it's isolation, whether it's elevated radiation, etc on Earth where you can test your science or your hardware uh, or the response of, of human subjects as potential crew members uh, in space. And so, of course, world over, you know, you have the NVHAB in Germany, you have the NEK in Russia, you have the Antarctic stations, uh, we have the Human Exploration Research Analog at NASA's Johnson Space Center, uh, uh, you have the, the NASA Space Radiation Labs for Elevated Radiation. So these are analog uh, environments that we've used for science to get ready for missions that have been very helpful. And a couple of other analogs that are um, also very innovative, I, I think, is now uh, ISS is being used as an analog for uh, doing experiments, uh, long duration experiments of, for the moon in preparation for getting to the moon. And then of course the moon will serve as an important analog for science and research for Mars. So uh, Nujud, I think analogs will continue to play a very important role for science. Certainly. What about uh, for anyone perhaps, uh, how do we bring the public more into these activities around analogs? Yeah, I can start with that. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say that I think the, the public has been very engaged because there are all these international locations. Investigators are able to use these much more easily uh, than the few missions that they get to, to go to space. Yeah, well, for us, uh, those Artemis, especially the signature of the agreement, made it a high interest on the public, which makes uh, uh, open to them the possibility that we are highly engaged in, in Moon and, and, and Mars. But most important, on the politician. I mean, the signature that we did was done by, by Bill Nelson, by the NASA administrator, at the Moncloa Palace, which is the palace of the president, in presence of the president, Pedro Sánchez, with the minister. That means we also need a political impulse for lunar exploration, and that helped us to get the political impulse, help our agencies uh, to, make, to make it easier so that we can get financing those activities. So Miguel, uh, speaking of the public and engagement, how are the Artemis Accords viewed in your agency and do they increase support for participation? Yeah. Uh, Artemis Accords uh, have generated interest in uh, space exploration in Japan, especially, not only for uh, space agency, but also the industries and also uh, a, uh, government. And uh, since Japan signed the Artemis Accord in 2020, uh, the country has been focusing on promoting the international space exploration, including Artemis program. So, and, uh, so uh, even the uh, uh, space uh, exploration's budget will be, uh, was increased after the Artemis Accord sign. And uh, the Japan was uh, one of the first group uh, of the signatory of the Artemis Accord, and the uh, Japanese government has been very active regarding the participation to the Artemis program. So uh, the government strongly support for the research and development the technology necessary for the human exploration uh, with the goal of sending the Japanese astronaut to the moon by the end of 2020. 
So you know, JAXA hopes to meet the, the uh, government expectation with the best of our technology and to play a major role in all these missions. Miguel, any other comments on the Artemis Accords? Artemis Accord? Uh, uh, Artemis Accord itself is a, uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, the, oh, just uh, supporting the Artemis Accord because uh, uh, our technically supporting the uh, Artemis Accord, but the uh, uh, Japanese government uh, signed, uh, so uh, it is uh, difficult to say. <laughs> Uh, so Artemis will now present us with an opportunity for human involvement that we haven't had in lunar exploration for decades. Um, what are your thoughts on the unique value humans bring to these Artemis missions and especially with respect to science? Uh, Sharmila. So, um, and, and then, you know, you should definitely uh, contribute to this as well, but I'll tell you from a personal perspective, I'm a great supporter. Uh, of the human factor in there for, for doing science. And I'll just give you a couple of examples uh, where from a personal standpoint of doing research in science, we have really relied on having the human crew member there uh, with their expert support. So, so for example, uh, back in the space shuttle uh, years, for example, we were doing this experiment which was highly complicated. It had many, many steps. It was a multi-generational experiment with live biological samples. You know, samples had to be fixed, frozen, brought back down live. So, uh, you know, went on for a long time with many moving parts there. And the German astronaut, Thomas Ryder, uh, was the person doing our science experiment in space, and he did an absolutely perfect job. In fact, the experiment was so complicated that on Earth, when the ground control was being done asynchronously after the flight mission uh, had progressed, uh, there were some hiccups with temperature control and stuff with the ground control, and the ground had to be redone. But Thomas Ryder did a perfect job in space, which really saved us a lot of time and effort, because getting a second flight is a lot harder than repeating ground control. Um, another example, on the SpaceX mission more recently, uh, we had another experiment where we were using a centrifuge uh, for half our samples. They were, they were going to be the 1G control in space. And suddenly in the middle of the, the mission, the centrifuge stopped working. And, you know, everyone was scrambling, trying to figure out what to do. And the Italian astronaut, uh, Samantha Cristoforetti, uh, you know, again, just human ingenuity, she uh, wrapped some tape around the centrifuge and she pulled it uh, like starting up a lawnmower and lo and behold the centrifuge started and uh, we were able to complete the experiment. So, so I think you know both for very complex experiments as well as for troubleshooting, uh, certainly for science in my experience, uh, having the human element there, uh, especially how expert our crew members are, uh, are it has been very important. I think that's, that's quite important what you said. But human flight had all the three components. One component is that help uh, to link society and space. Automatic system is far from the people. They don't feel that they affect them. But the first time we have an astronaut in Spain, people feel linked to the space because Pedro Duque was born in a normal part of Madrid, went to a public school, public universities, and everybody felt that they could be Pedro Duque. They could be flying. That means this gap between society and space is very much held by, by flying. Second thing is uh, vocation. We need vocation for space. And astronauts are a pubic relation tool to promote vocations, especially ladies, because we are in Spain only 20% of, of women talent in space. Then we need to foster that. And there is, there are, we have now two new astronauts. One is a lady, Sarah, and she is the model of many girls that has no reference. And it's the reference for the girls to be uh, to be uh, a space specialist or, or, or increase in that. And the third one is, not, is, a, is a very long term. The third one, it is adept with future generation. Our resources on Earth will end sooner or later for the population Then we need to, co to colonize other, other, other environments. And this is something that we have to do sooner or later. The sooner the better. This is a cost of opportunity. Then, in addition to what you said, that it is important for the exploration, there are other three aspects which are more related with the society, which I believe is quite important for human flight. So switching gears a little, Jim, 
So to you, uh, in terms of what NASA has been doing, we've been encouraging a lot of commercial partnerships for exploration. How would you characterize private sector investments and the uh, interests that we receive? I think we've been driving a lot of things for um, in, in the services contracts that we've gone out with. We've intentionally built off of the services we get for space station today in cargo and crew delivery uh, to our human lander. Um, I think our human lander, both procurements that we've done, we have one award to SpaceX and one award to Blue Origin, were for a service of providing crew on the, uh, on the surface and bringing them back to whatever vehicle they're docking with. And I think that we've leveraged what others want to do for their own private purposes. Uh, we maybe have advanced those a little bit with, I'll, I'll call it seed money, to bring their efforts forward. Um, and I think we've taken that into our other procurements. We're doing that with spacesuits. Um, spacesuits are provided to us as a service. They're installed in the lander, and our crew gets in the lander, goes down to the surface, and the suits are there for them. Um, we, we, we took a different approach with that. We obviously had a great deal of know-how within NASA uh, on spacesuit development, spacesuit maintenance. We actually made all of that available to uh, private industry and allowed them to, to uh, access it, to provide proposals that perhaps were based on that. We didn't require it. Um, but now we have that as a service. Now we're exploring our lunar terrain vehicle. We had a proposal, a, a request for proposal out for that that we received a number of responses to to provide the lunar terrain vehicle as a service on the surface. That's probably the biggest stretch because that's never been done before. Um, and but, but we're so we're kind of seeding industry to hopefully uh, maybe bring some of that back. Some of that's allowed us to defer cost to NASA by uh, private, industry, uh, uh, private investment on top of contract awards. So we're trying to, I, I'll take, I'll say, build off of our experience, but maybe take a, a more forward-leaning approach than we've done before. I, I think it's successful. The, the greatest question we always get is, where do, you, where do you stop? How do you decide? We do have a very formal acquisition uh, strategy uh, Council and approach that it, within the agency that decides from um, building it in house to uh, buying from a contractor to working with an international partner to buying it as a service. And we look at how that benefits our overall goals. And in this case, we bounce those against our Moon to Mars objectives, our architecture led by Najud, and, uh, and see what best fits to meet the demands of our missions to get our science done. So to follow up on that, a question from the app. Uh, can you share any insights on the progress we've made with HLS providers? Uh, sure. Well, I, I think, uh, you know, I, I just talked about them being as a service. So our, our interaction with the contractors are through insight as opposed to oversight. So we have insight teams that work both with SpaceX and now Blue Origin which are experts from across the agency in a, in a variety of disciplines, as well as systems engineers. Um, the, the progress is going well. I think you all know where we are with, uh, uh, with uh, SpaceX trying to get to their second launch. Uh, hopefully that'll happen here soon once they clear all the hurdles that they need to get through with the regulatory agencies. Um, but beyond that, uh, we were down in Boca Chica a couple months ago inside the, the simulator for uh, the HLS that SpaceX is building, where the crew, what it'll look like for the crew, the environmental control, life support systems, thermal control, uh, cockpit displays. Um, they're obviously working on all their engines that they need. A part of those go with the, uh, the upcoming launch. Um, I, I think. Uh, there's some hurdles that, that they have to get through, not just regulatory, technical. Uh, they have a number of launches they have to do for us. Next big milestone is where they do the cryogenic transfer from ship to ship. Um, after that is an uncrewed demo and then eventually our crew demo. They have to launch a lot to do our missions, so we're looking forward to seeing them get on that pace. Um, Blue Origin's a little bit earlier because we just awarded that contract earlier this year. Um, they're marching to their early design reviews. Um, our insight team that works with Blue Origin 
is uh, digging into the design, trying to make sure that we understand the areas that are of greatest concern to us around their design or just the mission in general. And then the other thing I'll say is we also have government task agreements where each contractor has requested a certain set of skills from NASA to, um, uh, to, to help them do the development. So those our folks effectively go work hands-on with, uh, with the developer to give them uh, direct help. So you know, sometimes it's, it's really bigger than, it, the program feels bigger than it, uh, than it really is, but we're focused every day because we're so down and in. Sometimes we need to take a step back and say, we're really pushing the limits with the contracts, we're pushing the limits of technical capabilities, and frankly, that's what we should do, not just NASA, we do as an international community for exploration. Thank you. And in terms of international cooperation and our uh, goals for further uh, collaboration, um, Sasaki-san, uh, science is an underlying principle of our exploration. It's one of our three nat whys we've articulated at NASA. How do you see science enabling more additional cooperation and collaboration? Yeah, uh, so I, I believe it's, uh, uh, the international cooperation uh, is an ideal approach to achieve the major science goals. As uh, we moved away from the, uh, us, so technical difficulties and the costs uh, uh, increase, but uh, we feel that it is very important to utilize uh, each other's strengths uh, to accomplish the major challenges. And also uh, to, uh, to share the knowledge and the data obtained uh, among the international community. And I also think that uh, science itself is as a uh, as a common goal for humankind. So uh, uh, science community is a very international <laughs> itself. So, so science also uh, support or uh, make government to conduct internationally, I think. And for example, uh, JAXA plans to be uh, first in the world uh, to return samples from the Martian moon Phobos with MMX. And uh, this uh, is an attempt to uh, create new knowledge by combining the JAXA sample return technologies and uh, Europe uh, uh, rovers and NASA uh, uh, systems. Uh, so such kind of uh, activities uh, support the civil missions and also uh, create the international movement, I think. Sharmila, anything to add? Yeah, I just wanted to add to what Sasaki-san said. Uh, you know, I agree with you completely. Uh, you know, science is essentially a team sport. You know, it is about uh, collaboration and cooperation. Um, and so in the ways that you said and the ways that we talked about earlier, you know, in terms of, you know, the lunar, ge lunar geology teams, the, the instruments that will be uh, going up on Artemis and Gateway, um, and so on, there are so many opportunities for international partners and industry partners and something that I wanted to make sure that I mentioned also today is open science and uh, this is something you know that you're, you're probably quite familiar in astronomy planetary science earth science uh, uh, biological and physical sciences there are these open science databases and I think this and and actually recently um, uh, so I'm in the Biological and Physical Sciences Division. We have an open science database called OSDR for Open Science Data Repository. Uh, and under that we have Gene Lab, which is, uh, you know, some omics data, but we also have non-omics data in non-human uh, fundamental research. And so recently we partnered with JAXA, for example, to cross-reference our databases, the databases that JAXA has for its science in this arena with the ones that we have. So that when investigators want to go in and find data, it's easier for them to find data from, from both uh, nations, from the work that's been done. Similarly, we're working now with ESA to figure out ways in which we can get uh, the data sets that are coming from ESA, from their space flight experiments, uh, for the non-human data that is uh, uh, federated with our data. So it makes it easier for the community. But, uh, you know, I think that also for this community at the IAC, it's an easy and a very convenient way to get involved in science, even when you don't have your own 
uh, experiment flying you know, in the near term, you can use these open science databases to access the science compared with your own ground-based research and then plan for future missions for Artemis or uh, low Earth orbit uh, you know, commercial platforms in the future. So I just wanted to add that. In this, uh, in this area, I would like to recall what Stephen Hawking liked to say, used to say, is that human beings is a kind of bride of, uh, of monkeys living in a small planet in an average star. But we can understand the universe. This is what makes us different. Then, this is the sign will help us to understand the universe, and this is not a country endeavor, it's, a, it's an international endeavor. And I think one of the most important parts of that was the data. And data demands robust comm systems. So uh, we do have a question in the app. Uh, needing all that common bandwidth, uh, what is the interest in the international provision of communication systems and potential interoperability strategy? Uh, Miguel, I know Spain is involved in the communication system. Perhaps you could speak a little bit about the future plans. Um, uh, I can hear very well, but you are asking about the, the future systems and uh, communication systems? Yeah, for communication. Yeah, you know that um, in Europe there is a new program called Moonlight, which is a European Space Agency optional program, where uh, Spain is the second biggest contributor after Italy, and the purpose is to provide communication and navigation services uh, uh, to lunar missions. And um, this is a PPP, that means it is, uh, it is funded by the industry, because the idea is to commercially provide that. That means that it is a step forward uh, uh, offering, uh, well, as we have geostationary or Starlink uh, system doing communication on the Earth to start also giving services on the moon uh, to the different missions of NASA, JAXA, or, or the players. And Jim, any thoughts on the interoperability and how we encourage the international collaboration there? I, I think the international collaboration, as I said earlier, is essential. We encourage the interoperability by how, how do we maximize all of our science return. We have very specific needs for our crewed missions. But we're going to have needs for all the instruments that we leave behind, or operation of our lunar terrain vehicle to do science when we're not there. And that science is going to have to be international based. So by, by making the interoperability standards um, and what we expect everyone to work to, everyone will benefit by getting the science back. Um, everyone will be able to use different assets. Um, either in, in high data rate uh, scenarios or high data return scenarios, or when there's a problem, we can then still depend on getting the data back by using multiple, um, uh, multiple, I'll say, missions or constellations or services. And I think all that's based on what we're doing today on the International Space Station in terms of interoperability, things that we've proved out there with, uh, with docking as, a, as an example. Uh, so to leverage that, uh, perhaps Sharmila first, do you see opportunities for small satellites to contribute to your science goals in future Artemis missions? Yes, absolutely. In fact, um, uh, one of the, on one of the early slides that I, I showed, one of the experiments called BioSentinel was actually uh, an experiment that we did on a free flyer. And yes, so, so those are automated experiments, and I think they will serve an extremely important role uh, in going to, to regions, you know, in, in deep space and experiencing some of, for example, elevated radiation. Um, and doing science uh, in those areas on free flyers. I think free flyers will serve as a very important uh, platform for us as well. Any other thoughts on small satellites? Uh, perhaps Sasaki-san? Yeah, uh, uh, director, I uh, want to say that uh, uh, interoperability, I think, uh, is uh, important for the international collaboration. So uh, interoperability or uh, in, in uh, same uh, standard, using the same standards uh, uh, in case of the I ISS program. So we can, uh, NASA, is, uh, uh, JAXA, uh, uh, combine the same system. And also, uh, for, uh, in case of the uh, communications, also uh, we need to uh, set up the interoperabilities. And so we, we can easily uh, uh, coordinate to the, uh, to the uh, frequency or uh, some systems. So such kind of activities are important for the international collaboration. 
Uh, so a, a little bit different, this, this question is to NASA, but I think it's uh, equally appropriate for everyone. What is NASA doing specifically to address the physiological and neurological challenges that our astronauts are facing with long-term space occupation? Shamila? Yeah, that's a great question. So, so definitely, um, you know, the good news is we know we've been to the moon and back, so that's the good part. But we also know from all the work, all the studies that have been done on the International Space Station, that there are effects, uh, neurological and other physiological, like, you know, immune, cardiovascular, uh, effects on the muscle, effect on the bone. So, so there are several ways in which these are, and, and one of the, um, uh, things that I mentioned briefly is using the International Space Station as a long duration analog for future lunar and Mars missions. That's been one very important way in which we're beginning to get a sense of what long uh, duration exposure to spaceflight uh, in reduced gravity or microgravity as well as elevated radiation. So, so that's one way. Other ways in which we are doing a preliminary work that will help us towards deep space exploration is, of course, ground studies. And for example, using facilities, Chiba Japan has facilities, Europe has facilities, uh, the US has facilities where you can simulate uh, deep space radiation. It's not ideal in that you get the same composition of uh, radiation particles, but it's not the same uh, dose and dose rate and the, the continuous exposure uh, that we will get when we're in those, uh, in those modes, which is why you have to also do the space flight studies. And that previous question about free flyers is therefore very important. So a combination of doing things on the ground, doing things on free flyers, doing things on the surface of the moon, uh, and doing extended duration studies on ISS, all of these are what we're planning uh, to help us get to that ultimate goal. So uh, a little bit going off that. Uh, so how do we ensure we have enough data in the physiological and biological um, realm to assure that we're ready for Mars? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And I think one of the biggest challenges at this point is the effect of radiation, because that's something that we probably know uh, the least about in some uh, senses. On the other hand, the, the good part is that there are a lot of sensors we just talked about. There are sensors, uh, again, that all these international agencies are partnering to get sensors on Artemis One. There was also a vest. Uh, uh, this was, again, an international partnership uh, uh, as well as with international industry where they were uh, testing a vest that could protect uh, uh, you know, protect the soft tissue uh, organs inside our bodies to see how, how effectively this particular vest could, could protect us from uh, uh, this deep space radiation. So, so I think really the answer to that question as to when will we be ready, when will we feel ready to be in Mars uh, or go to Mars, I think will rely on continuing the science that we're doing on Artemis missions, continuing the science that we're doing in low Earth orbit, continuing the science that we're doing on the ground. Um, and as we've seen, you know, we weren't sure if we'd be ready for the International Space Station. And lo and behold, you know, 20 years have gone by and we've got a lot of research done there. And, and I would predict that it would be similar in our uh, aspiration of getting back to, the Mar uh, to, to Mars is all of the work that the science community does will build towards giving us that confidence um, uh, to, to do it. So uh, a bit of a question for a few. Uh, at what point will Gateway be functional and do you imagine it being somewhat like the ISS, aka an internationally cooperative science focused destination? Perhaps Jim, you can start. Uh, so right now, Gateway will launch between Artemis 3 and Artemis 4, and we'll do our first landing on Artemis 4 staged from Gateway. And that'll be, the, uh, be launched with the Habitation and Logistics Outpost and the Power and Propulsion Element. Those will be launched together on a, a Falcon Heavy vehicle. Uh, the Artemis 4 launch will take up the international habitation uh, provided by uh, ESA and the uh, life support by JAXA. Um, and uh, it'll, the Orion will push IHAB and DACA to, to Gateway. Um, 
you know, I, we're doing science as soon as Gateway's launched uh, on the Falcon Heavy. So from my perspective, Gateway's uh, uh, going uh, from the get-go for science. And then um, we'll slowly add to that. There'll be the Esprit refueling module also provided by ESA will be added to, uh, to Gateway. And then we'll have logistics vehicles provided both by uh, NASA and eventually by JAXA. So with all that collaboration, uh, maybe Sasaki-san, uh, what science do you see in Gateway's future? What science do you see in Gateway's future? I, I use this? Science on the Gateway. Gateway. Ah, so future. No. So uh, compare the uh, 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 environment of the, uh, with uh, ISS, uh, uh, Gateway is uh, uh, very uh, different from the uh, lower orbit because uh, so uh, radiations or something. So uh, we want to uh, collaborate the uh, 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 collecting the data for the such kind of uh, uh, environment. And also, uh, since uh, it is uh, I mean, uh, it is difficult to say, but the uh, uh, gateway is very smaller than uh, ISS, so uh, we could not put that big uh, instrument in a uh, uh, gateway, so uh, we need to co collaborate and joint uh, small instrument are necessary to conduct the science, I think. So on terms of the surface of the moon, we've had a couple questions about the plans to protect the far side of the moon from radio frequency interference. Uh, it's a precious place to build future telescopes, so how will we uh, protect the far side of the moon? Ah, red frequency, yeah? So, uh, I'm sorry, I, I is not a specialist for these areas, but uh, uh, we are now uh, uh, learning to the how to uh, protect the uh, radiation or something. Uh, we, we often uh, talk with the NASA and the ESA to uh, proceed uh, uh, development work. So Jim, anything else to add on yeah, protecting? I, I would say, um, going back to your question about the Artemis Accords, the first thing we're trying to do with the Accords is preserve the pristine environment on the moon, both at the South Pole, where it may be resource rich, or, or where uh, significant observations can be made from the moon, like the far side, where you get away from that radio interference. Um, actually, that was a, one of the topics at the Accords meeting today was one of the working groups had looked at uh, how do we make sure we don't have interference on the lunar surface, not just landing on top of someone else's lander, but also how do we keep the scientific viability of the moon? I think that'll be an ongoing set of um, analysis and studies that we have to do. Um, I think we need to start, and I, I don't know that I, I, the science mission directorate has started this at NASA. I've heard it from some of our international partners, is start looking at what are those missions that we can do on that far side in the near term to gather some of that so that if there is unintentional interference that we uh, can benefit from the uh, science before those that could get uh, potentially obstructed. Uh, just scrolling through here. Uh, so keying off that, a question. Who will, who will regulate what happens on the moon? I'm sorry that maybe uh, Jim is a good person to answer. I like that you had to answer first. Uh, that was a better way. Um, yeah, I, I mentioned the Accords. The Accords are the principles by which we're going to operate. So I don't think there's going to be anyone that regulates what's done on the moon. I think the principles how we operate are going to do that. And that's trying to not disturb other folks sites, trying to keep those science areas pristine, trying to respect the history that's on the moon of what's already landed there. Um, we don't want to land on top of, uh, we don't want anyone, we wouldn't, but land on top of the Apollo 11 site or disturb that site because we think that's important to human history. That's why for us the Accords are so important and the 29 country, 28 other countries that have signed it are so important because we feel like that is our way to mutually agree on what we're gonna do on the lunar surface. 
um, because there isn't that, that body that we that can or should regulate it. It's how we operate, and we hope that more countries sign on to, to agree to those principles around which we're going to protect uh, the moon and not, in some cases, do what we did to our own planet uh, here on Earth. Well, it, well, it's clear that the United Nations, UNCOPUOS, is who has to play this um, organized happening on the surface of the moon. But we have more urgent issues, which is what to do in the, on the Earth. We need to go first to the space traffic management on the Earth, and then we organize what happened in the Moon. <laughs> because we are, I mean, we have some important duties to do in the very short term uh, in space, but probably we'll need to hit today high priority to space traffic management on low Earth orbit, and then go to United Nations to, to organize what happened in the Moon. All right, time for a couple more questions. So first one, uh, looking backwards, what are some of the biggest differences between Artemis and exploration today and Apollo? Uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll take kind of the, I'll say the, the vehicle side of things, and I'd love for you to address the science side of things. From the vehicle side of things, um, number one, we would not know what we know today about getting to the moon um, without what was done on Apollo. We never want to overlook what Apollo has given us uh, from a technological perspective, from a, a lunar environment perspective, we, we never want to lose sight of that. So anything I'm about to say is just built off of Apollo. I think we've built a vehicle in, in the Orion uh, capsule that's uh, capable of 21 days in, in deep space. Um, that includes uh, some ability to protect for, for radiation. That includes the life support systems. Um, so I think we've, and, and obviously it carries four people, um, it's designed to, for those four people to leave and all four go down to the surface. Um, I think we're, we're trying to go back for a sustainable exploration, which to us means uh, getting pe four people down to the surface and staying for 30 days um, to, to get that longer duration uh, exposure. Uh, we're trying to get to a point where it is truly a broad international collaboration to go there. We went there for a specific reason in the 60s from a specific mandate from our president. Now we're going back and as uh, Sharmila talked about for Artemis 1, we're going back internationally on science and in the vehicle. So to me it's, it's built off of Apollo but we're trying to take that next step with Mars on the horizon. And I can uh, take it uh, to, to build on what Jim just said, uh, agree with everything Jim just said. Uh, for the science as well, I think it's just, it's building. So to give you one example, uh, we're very interested in the effects of regolith, uh, you know, on humans as well as biological systems, as well as as a substrate to grow plants for long-term uh, sustained stays on the lunar surface and in future in Mars. So, so far we've had samples from the Apollo uh, collection, which has been very useful. They've been very carefully archived uh, at Johnson Space Center. But as a scientist, to get those samples, because they're so exceedingly precious, uh, it is not easy to get samples to do science for, from the Apollo regolith. However, now that we have the, the uh, hope and the expectation from Artemis 3, 4, Five, et cetera, that more samples will be collected. And then, of course, you know, you, you probably all heard we just got samples back from, from an asteroid uh, recently. And so as more and more of these samples come back, it just allows uh, all of us to do more science. And so we will now be able to access that regolith material. You know, regolith is sort of the dust that you get from the lunar surface or from the asteroid surface. And we'll be able to start doing more extensive tests to see, you know, are there any uh, uh, subtle or not so subtle toxic effects? Uh, if so, how can we counter them? Can we go plants on them? There's actually a study that came out uh, last year, which was very exciting, that showed that we can grow plants using lunar uh, soil from the Apollo uh, missions, but it was tiny amounts of soil, only one very simple experiment, uh, but we want to grow those experiments. We want to learn more and, and having uh, more and more science done and more and more samples collected and brought back from Artemis will help us grow what the Apollo era started. 
So for our last question, looking forward, uh, Sasaki-san, uh, how can we use the moon for expansion and exploration beyond the moon? What are your goals? Goals? Goals beyond. Beyond, yeah. Uh, so at this moment, so the axis is, uh, uh, the target is only on the moon at this moment. In the, but uh, of course, uh, the moon is a uh, uh, demonstration, technical demonstration uh, area to go to the uh, mud. So, uh, pass, but just personally, personally uh, uh, our goal is uh, uh, to human presence in uh, mud. And Miguel, how about uh, your country? Well, it's clear that it is a step toward Mars. That's natural, and we will check all the life support systems. We can check all the different things that we need to, to go to the next, next step. And uh, that has to be done in the moon. We two days distance, and uh, this is a good step to go to a one-year distance, which is Mars. Huh? Well, thank you all. Uh, it's been a great conversation, and thank you uh, to the audience. Um, so thank you, uh, and uh, appreciate all of you joining us here today.
Good afternoon, I'm David Thomas. I'm the Executive Director of the Milo Institute at Arizona State University. Uh, thank you for joining us at this uh, Global Network Forum. Today we have a panel of distinguished individuals and we're gonna be talking about a very interesting topic. Uh, this is uh, around infrastructure and if you think about sort of what's happening over the course of the next few years, uh, NASA's Artemis program is driving a tremendous amount of infrastructure development for the moon. Uh, you have companies like Lockheed Martin that are developing satellites that are gonna provide communication and navigation. You have SpaceX and Blue Origin that are gonna be developing uh, 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 fuel repositories on the moon as part of human landing systems. All of these bits of infrastructure create opportunities for new players and new participants in new ways. So we can think of commercial services that allow perhaps those players that may not have space heritage to participate. We can think of new ways of doing scientific research, new business models, and so I, I, I believe this is gonna be a fascinating uh, conversation. So please join me in welcoming our panelists to the stage. So I'm gonna provide, uh, each one is gonna provide a few bit, a minutes of introduction. I'm gonna ask questions. I wanna encourage everyone to please use the Slido app. I'll weave in some of your questions uh, as well. And so with that, I will turn it over to AC Trania, sir, uh, your introduction. All right, uh, thank you, Dave. Um, welcome to IAC 2023. Uh, I think I was looking back, this might be my 17th or 18th IAC, so uh, always happy to join our friends around the planet here every year. Um, a little bit about me and a little bit about what I'm doing at NASA. So a little bit um, about my personal prof and pers professional history to get to this stage. Um, grew up in Atlanta, Georgia, and went to the Georgia Institute of Technology, so Georgia Tech. And uh, since that time, have been involved uh, for 23 years in terms of commercial space and aviation prior to coming to NASA. That journey included uh, uh, working at a startup uh, based in Atlanta and then Washington, D.C. for about 12 years, where we did a lot of advanced concepts, systems analysis for NASA, DARPA, Air Force, commercial space entities. I was also proud in that experience to do collaborative space projects with companies in Japan and South Korea. Um, and that you know, has guided my interest in international collaborations to this day. Uh, in 2012, I joined uh, Virgin Galactic, uh, as some of you may know, and I was on the initial team that formed the Launcher One program, which eventually became uh, Virgin Orbit. Uh, so was involved in strategy, business development, advanced concepts. Um, me, the chief engineer at Virgin Galactic, were given a special mission by then boss, our boss Steve Asakowitz, to go look at an alternate aircraft for the Launcher One program, which ended up in us selecting the 747-400. So yes, I have bought a 747-400 in my career uh, and put a left wing on the, uh, a rocket on the left wing. Um, so that was an incredible journey was also involved in uh, the OneWeb, the discussions between Virgin Galactic and OneWeb for uh, a multi-launch contract. Um, and from that experience then went to Blue Origin. And so when I joined Blue Origin in, in uh, 2017, uh, they basically said, hey, we're starting a lunar lander program, here you go, it was me and two engineers. So we kicked off an entire five-year journey that resulted in uh, technology demonstrations using New Shepard and NASA landing sensors to multiple studies in collaboration with NASA to working hand-in-hand in -hand and maturing rocket engine technology with NASA Marshall to then forming the national team with Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, and Draper for the initial human landing system base period performance. So we won half a billion dollars from NASA uh, to mature that crewed lander mission. Um, and uh, then subsequently the reformulation of the Lunar Lander Program at Blue Origin into the Lunar Permanence Program and then into a, the current architecture that they have today. Um, then in 2022, uh, went to a, an aviation startup called Reliable Robotics, and that was um, kind of rounding up my space, space experience with an aviation um, kind of autonomy company where that company was trying to modify existing aircraft uh, to fly automated for all the world's cargo carriers. So a very interesting experience in space and aviation 
in early part of technology infusion. I probably have been involved in probably 50 plus projects, studies that have gone from the back of an envelope to PDR and then some have continued on to CDR. So that has been my professional experience of getting things matured to a certain phase. Now at NASA, coming into NASA, I think um, the agency wanted to think and leverage the exper these experiences in commercial public-private partnerships and thus why I think I came into the agency. And so my mandate at NASA headquarters is to support our administrative suite, or A suite as we call it. So the A suite at NASA consists of our top three leaders, uh, Administrator Bill Nelson, Deputy Administrator Pam Melroy, and Associate Administrator Bob Cabana. So those are my three leaders that our office in the Office of Technology Policy and Strategy support kind of as the headspace for our senior leaders. So we tackle problems that are across directorate, tackles uh, problems that are interagency, problems that may include international collaborations for our senior leaders. And the power I have at NASA is not a large budget, it is not a large team. What I do have is, is a, a, a very powerful spotlight. And what I can do is for our senior leaders, spotlight gaps, issues, problems, and help coordinate different technologies ranging from quantum to AI to other technologies that span across our directorates. So it's a pretty interesting position um, and I'm looking at how the agency can innovate better in early stage technologies, how we can uh, think about some of the emerging technologies like quantum and AI, and uh, how do we also think about as, as uh, we have a panel later this, this week on technology infusion. And that's another intellectual problem I'm trying to think about of we are maturing all these technologies within various parts of NASA, but how do our missions use it? So yep, the panel before us, Jim Free from NASA who runs our Exploration Systems Mission Directorate was talking about the Artemis program. So I tried to think about how are the technologies we're investing in, investing in now support Jim, support Artemis, um, to enable us to make Artemis uh, different than Apollo, to be able to have more sustained lunar exploration. And those are the kind of intellectual problems I try to wrestle with. And the tools I have are um, early stage innovation uh, investment, uh, collaborations with other government agencies, collaborations with commercial industry and international collaborations. So, thanks. Thank you, AC. Ard Benyev is the Chief Technology Officer for the Australian Space Agency. Uh, Ard, we look forward to your introduction. Thank you, and thank you for uh, having me here. Um, the Australian Space Agency is still very young. We uh, just celebrated our fifth uh, anniversary. Uh, but this, despite that, we can already see the outcomes of the uh, investment we've done across several projects. We have 60 projects under our belt just now, some still going. Um, project small, projects big, um, but it's very good to see the outcome and impact we're having on the industry uh, in Australia. In our role in the, in the office of the CTO, we are assessing the space capability of Australia. We are looking at the opportunity for this capability to grow. We're scoping projects and programs for helping this, uh, this capability to, uh, to fulfill their potential, and we're delivering this, uh, this program. Um, these programs and projects are across several disciplines, PNT, comms, space uh, medicine, uh, but one I would like to focus on today is around uh, our off-earth uh, opportunity, which are rising. Um, as you know, in Australia, we have been um, operating large-scale uh, operations from remote location. Um, I will always remember the first time I visited uh, a Rio Tinto Mission Control Center in, in Perth. Um, I had the impression to enter in a, in a mini Houston type of, uh, of mission control because there was a great focus and, and concentration in that room. And there were different pods um, dealing with different activities. Uh, I approached the pods of, uh, mining, of drilling and I was talking with a lady who was dealing this, uh, doing this drilling operation and uh, she was doing some drilling operation located 2,000 kilometers away in the Pilbara region. She was using communication links through geo satellites, so the user interface that she was using was uh, catering for the delay that this, uh, this entailed. Um, and when you look at this expertise of, of doing this kind of remote operation, um, this is what we try to capture in this top right uh, picture behind me. This uh, capability we have on the ground, how can we export that uh, in space? What can we learn in space to make this operation um, more efficient and more sustainable? And how we can we spin back this learning back, back on Earth? Uh, so this is what we're concentrating on just now uh, in Australia when we're talking about deep space exploration. Next slide, please. And we have uh, 
put in place a moon to mars initiative along three pillars a supply chain is really looking at the capability we have with, with some terrestrial products we're helping this industry uh, to make these products space qualified so they can enter the, the space uh, supply chain ecosystem uh, we have a demonstrator uh, project where we are looking into helping industry to do at the end-to-end -end life cycle of a space project from feasibility up to operation. We have 20 projects um, happening around this, uh, this initiative. And last but not least, we have our Trailblazer program, which is uh, our rover uh, to the moon. Next, please. As I said, I could, I'm not going to talk about the 60 projects we are doing, but I just want to take two seconds on, on three of them. And advanced navigation is developing some uh, innovative inertial navigation systems. One of them is going to be on board the uh, intuitive machine missions that should be launched um, before the end of the year. Could be the first Australian tech landing on the moon, so we are very excited about that. Uh, Fleet has developed a, a geode who help measure the seismic noise in such a way that they can build a 3D model of underground and see where interesting resources are and what type of resource they are. We are looking to miniat miniaturize uh, these geodes so that we could maybe deploy that on the moon um, because that would be a great way to look at for resources on the moon in a non-invasive manner. Uh, and Skycraft has designed an interesting a pizza box shape uh, CubeSat, um, or actually satellites, um, and they're de deploying a um, um, constellation around uh, Earth to help with uh, air traffic management services. Next, please. And then this is our um, big, um, boldest adv adventure yet, our, uh, our rover. So uh, we will launch this with, uh, with NASA. We're going to piggy ride. Uh, a ride with, uh, with the NASA CLEPS. Uh, we have currently two consortia competing to uh, deliver a prototype, and at PDR, will we down select to one, um, which will be the happy winner to, uh, to launch um, that rover on the moon to demonstrate this remote operation capability I was talking about. Next, um, very quickly, the previous panel was talking about the four moon to Mars uh, objective uh, that NASA has, uh, has um, explained in several documents. So the 60 projects, we map them against these four uh, objectives. And we also add the TRL level of each of these projects because five years old we are, um, but some of these TRL are nine. So we are already um, able to support today um, some of the um, niche services there. And the last slide was to show the infrastructure that you have all across Australia to support deep space exploration. It goes from um, test centers, um, optical ground station, uh, research center to develop um, plant for space. Um, there is lots of information in there, but we're going to put all that on, the, on our website. So this is what we are looking at developing and, and promoting for supporting space exploration. Thank you, Anne. Next, we have Dan Shears. Dan is a University of Colorado Distinguished Professor and the A. Richard C. Bass Chair in Aerospace Engineering Sciences at uh, the University of Colorado Boulder. Dan? Thanks, Dave, and uh, thanks uh, very much for coming. Um, first, I'll just say a few words, and I just have a couple slides. I'm coming at this from a slightly different perspective. I've been on the science side and uh, a bit on the engineering side for uh, over 30 years, uh, with my focus mainly being on asteroid missions. So I, I was a member of the NEAR mission, the first uh, rendezvous mission with an uh, asteroid, and I've been involved with the Hayabusa missions, uh, Hayabusa and Hayabusa 2. Um, uh, most recently, I've been involved with the Cyrus-Rex, which just came back and uh, several other missions uh, uh, currently and moving into the future. Um, so in some sense, uh, being on the science side, I'm the end user of the technology. And in some ways, we can recognize what technologies we may need in order to advance our scientific exploration um, uh, uh, focus. Um, I, I'm also maybe looking a little bit beyond the moon because I'm interested in the solar system, the solar system dynamics, and, and the primitive bodies that are in the solar system. So hopefully that can also provide an interesting perspective. One of the interesting things that I want to at least point out is the scale of these missions uh, that, we, that we fly, that NASA has flown, can be immense. If you take the next slide. 
so the OSIRIS-REx mission uh, was a mission that I was a co-I on, and it was incredibly successful, and it remains incredibly successful, because the samples need to be analyzed over the next few years, and the satellite gets to be repurposed. This is a huge mission, uh, probably the largest um, asteroid-focused mission to date that, that at least NASA has, um, has supported. 50 science co-eyes, it started its phase B at least 12 years ago, uh, development 15, 18 years ago, and uh, it's still going. So this is one example, uh, especially of a type of mission that NASA does extremely well at but it requires a lot of support across the board, infrastructure that is existing, that we're tapping into, and, um, uh, and developing new ideas and new capabilities. Uh, just to show a couple um, uh, eye charts, this is the project organization, and the next one is the science COI, list of COIs. So it's a cast of literally thousands when you start adding up all of the people. So that's been an exhilarating uh, experience to be involved with OSIRIS-REx. Uh, let's go to the next slide. I've also been uh, involved at the other end of the spectrum, and I was PI of the Janus mission, one of the NASA Simplex missions, where our costs are capped at 50 to 55 million dollars. Very small satellites, but we have very large scientific goals that we carry out. Um, and this is just an artist's rendition of what the Janus spacecraft were designed to do, which was to fly by some binary asteroids in the solar system. So this is a very different scale of mission, and it's a rideshare mission, so we don't control the launch. So we were uh, originally scheduled to go with uh, NASA's Psyche. With the delay, we were pulled off, so the spacecraft are actually waiting for their next adventure still. However, at the smaller scale, if you take the next slide, we see the, the mission organization is uh, order of magnitude, maybe two orders of magnitude um, smaller, especially in how we run the mission. Uh, I was the PI. We had a handful of science team co-eyes. Uh, we had a couple very competent uh, and, and well-designed instruments so supplied by Malin Space Science. And uh, it, it was very much uh, streamlined. So looking at these two uh, ends of the spectrum, you really start to understand when you have a very expensive mission, you have to invest to have high guarantees across the board. When you have these very small focused missions, you can actually tolerate a lot more risk. And that actually opens up uh, a lot of ideas for technology development. Um, so that's, that's my intro. Thank you, Dan. And for the next, we have a video. Uh, Ramon Blanco is the U.S. Head of Space at Added Value Systems, AVS, leading the strategic expansion of its uh, space division from Europe into the U.S. market. Do we have the video? Uh
So that, that was a nice way to start and save me a few words. <laughs> but I'll do a very quick story about uh, my introduction to uh, the space industry. I think I came in, my love for space came in fairly late compared probably to most people in this industry. I didn't really think about dedicating my life to space until my last year of university, doing aerospace engineering. In fact, my, my goal in studying that was improving the way we travel uh, point to point on Earth, just making planes faster. That was my, my big challenge when I started. Uh, but there was this one mission uh, at the end of my university called Inspiration Mars. That was one of the first times that that competition ran by the, uh, by the Mars Society. And that provided for me a, a, a new experience that I hadn't had through my years of university, focusing more on aircraft engineering. The opportunity to solve some of the hardest problems, one of the biggest challenges, almost starting from scratch. There was no, no really a, an architecture that was established as the good way to do it. Uh, and even, even further, this, this competition was expected to orientate potentially a real mission to attempt to bring for first time two astronauts on a flyby mission around Mars. So that ability to really solve problems from scratch, innovate, uh, and, the, and yeah, the fact that pretty much the space frontier was, uh, was uh, open, for, open for new, uh, new solutions to be provided, that got me, that got me to, uh, to not look back. From that moment, I went on to work uh, at a startup trying to solve one of the biggest problems that I discovered uh, during that competition, which was launch. We needed bigger launchers. This was, say, I think around 2012, 2013. A couple of big launchers were planned for development, but still it was a very big challenge to get a, humans, a human mission to Mars. So went on to try to, tr to do that for a couple of years in a startup. Eventually I joined one of the big prime contractors, Thales Alenia Space, where I saw a little bit more the reality of the, of the industry, had the opportunity to work on a broad range of missions from uh, telecommunications, Earth observation, interplanetary, some of the biggest geosatellite programs or constellations. And finally, I landed where uh, what I consider today my home, ABS, Added Value Solutions, uh, finding a very close connection uh, with their mission, which is boosting scientific knowledge. And that was a surprise to find a commercial company, private company with that mission. And the moment, the more I knew about it, it just convinced me that's what I wanted to spend the rest of my career. And some of the, th some of the great things that uh, ABS has achieved over the years, trying to uh, do just that, trying to solve some of the most difficult problems uh, for larger companies, for agencies, and, and supporting that goal to boost really uh, uh, exploration, scientific knowledge through engineering solutions. Um, yeah, I think the, what, uh, what we're seeing in the, in the current times with the growth of commercialization and uh, what has been denominated as new space um, is providing the tools for more and more companies to dream big and to try to think about how to solve some of the biggest problems that before uh, that thought was only limited to some of the larger companies, perhaps universities and agencies. But right now, uh, we are able to have more minds thinking how to solve those, the biggest problems for humanity. Uh, and I think that's gonna yield faster uh, faster solutions, most effective solutions, and we will hopefully be able to do more and more as, uh, as we go in the, in the next years of uh, yeah, space exploration. Thank you, Ramon. So, uh, AC, I'll, I'll come to you first. So, NASA is investing a tremendous amount into infrastructure. It's going to enable new ways of doing exploration, commerce. Can you give us a little bit of an insight into uh, what NASA is planning and, and, and the infrastructure is preparing to build. 
Yeah, thanks. Um, if you were here at the last panel, uh, Jim Free from NASA had a QR code, uh, nasa.gov slash architecture. And I'd encourage folks to go to that website where we have, I think, for the first time in many decades, as we've been looking at exploration, put out our plans and thinking and strategy publicly. The Australian Space Agency today just showed a slide, thank you, of using our Moon to Mars objectives and mapping what they're doing to the objectives and uh, the principles that we put out in that document. And we did that exactly for this reason, as you just, you just so great, gratefully showed, is we want to share with our partners how we're thinking about going back to the moon, the primary reasons, the decomposed objectives, the plans, and where can you all fit in, right? That's why that QR code exists. That's why that website exists. And I'm particularly interested in um, one particular segment, as we call it, of our, of our Artemis plan. So if you open that document, we lay out the next few decades in various segments of exploration. Um, Jim Free in the last uh, panel had a human lunar return segment. Those are the initial Ar Artemis missions. There's another segment of exploration we call it sustained lunar evolution. And I'm very keen on that, that piece of our lunar exploration campaign that goes to services. I think that campaign is we have the ability to land on the surface for six and a half days. Maybe we now extending that to 30 days. What are the additional services to enrich those kinds of exploration missions? And uh, we have put out there various contracts uh, for services ranging from uh, crewed lander systems to spacesuits to lunar terrain vehicles. Now we're looking at uh, cislunar commercial uh, communications and position navigation timing, and there could be more more in the future as well. Um, and I'm very encouraged by the not only the various pieces from transportation to suits to mobility to cislunar comms P and T. Um, but the way we're going about it, both in terms of tech development, where our Space Technology Mission Director is maturing technologies and innovative contracts that then we can infuse into these programs for particular exploration uh, campaigns and, or segments uh, to enable longer missions. So going from six and a half days to 30 days to maybe even longer, what do we need on the, uh, the services we need for um, to hit that sustained lunar evolution segment of our exploration campaign. Excellent. And uh, of course, Australia has a, a wonderful history of supporting space infrastructure, going back to the Apollo program. What plans does Australia have to support the, this infrastructure in the future? Lots and uh, lots of vision and ambition for that as well. Uh, and you're right, um, some of the video tracks and audio tracks of this uh, lunar landing um, back in the days uh, passed through some Australian ground station. Uh, as you know, in, um, in Canberra, uh, we are hosting a couple of antennas for the Deep Space uh, Network for NASA JPL. Uh, these antennas are operated uh, and maintained by C our colleagues at uh, CSIRO, um, and they are participating in upgrading this, uh, these antennas. We also host um, a few antennas from the ESA S-Track um, ground uh, network um, in New Norcia in the Western Australia. We have actually co-founded the development of, of their third uh, antenna there, ground station, and then 3 um, So communication on the ground is very important to us. Uh, we have a location uh, looking at southern sky, which makes us critical in any uh, uh, network for, for communication in, in deep space. Um, and without communication, there is no space mission. It's just as simple as that. So we, we understand how critical uh, communication infrastructure is. Um, we are funding um, the development of two optical ground stations. Uh, we have blue sky, so uh, this is good to do optical communication. Uh, but we need more than two. So we have one in uh, Western Australia, developed by University of Western Australia. Um, their expertise is in how to cater with the atmospheric distortion that um, uh, challenge the, uh, the optical communication. And we have another one uh, developed by the Australian National University, ANU in Canberra. Um, their expertise is around adaptive optics. So we are very, luck very lucky to fund uh, two optical stations like that um, across two uh, very cutting edge disciplines. But two is not enough. Um, we have blue sky, but we also have bushfires. So we are we have that vision of developing an Australian optical ground station network so we, we can reach this 99.9% of, uh, of uh, reliability. Um, so that's for comms, um, but in terms of infrastructure, we're also developing um, mission control that are specifically uh, focused on remote 
operation for space exploration. Uh, so we have uh, co-founded a facility in uh, Western Australia uh, with Fugro, um, and I believe that will be the first dedicated remote operation uh, center in the world. Um, and we are also looking into bringing more facilities to do radiation testing. Um, because LEO is something, but the moon, around the moon and beyond, radiation is, is harsh. And, and I think we don't have enough facilities to test single effects, single event effect, uh, gamma, X-ray. Um, for a, a certain size, often you have facilities that can just bombard a small area uh, of equipment. So we've, uh, we sponsored a few uh, activities to have a, 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 an area of the size of a PCB so you can have some, uh, some interesting re results. Um, we also have a lot of analog sites uh, in Australia that uh, we, we are promoting, but uh, yeah, that these are, these are the, the, the kind of main infrastructure work we are currently doing. Um, and our role in the agency is to promote uh, this infrastructure to the world, so I'm very happy to uh, be there to promote these, uh, these capabilities that we have. Thank you, Anne. So, Dan, in your introduction, you did a wonderful job explaining how universities are really at the edge of science. and leading exploration, new instrumentation, miniaturization of systems. Can you help us understand from a university perspective how infrastructure will advance your ability and other universities' ability to engage in space exploration and science so we can understand our solar system better? Yeah, uh, thanks, David, for the question. Um, as you mentioned, uh, universities are, are really where most of the uh, ideas that become reality initially are born, right? Uh, of course, um, we need to first of all go from the laboratory into the technology and industry uh, infrastructure, which can uh, take some of these great ideas and either through a spin off company or through investment, you know, bring them into the space infrastructure, which I, I think is all the industry, the government labs, and the like. So that's sort of the, the stepping, that's the most important first step in the infrastructure. Um, and then as we uh, uh, tile the, the, you know, the Earth-Moon system, as we develop, you know, the communication stations and systems, as we uh, figure out how to use uh, and implement new uh, uh, communications and propulsion technologies, um, I, I think what that does is it opens the door for the universities to start to develop lower cost solutions, uh, innovative solutions to carrying out certain scientific missions um, where we can leverage the, the investments that have been made by the national space agencies uh, and, and also by the, uh, you know, the larger companies. Uh, and that really allows us to ride on the, the coattails of these, um, of, of these investments. Um, I, we could go through a long list of different uh, investments that have been made that enable a lot of the, the interesting science uh, that, that we can conceive of now, that we can design space missions for. I'm, I'm not sure if that, you know, coming up with, with lists is, is what our goal is here. But I will certainly attest to the fact that um, the more infrastructure that exists, um, especially communications infrastructure, navigation infrastructure um, in cislunar space and even beyond, uh, the, the, um, yeah, the, the, the more we can design low-cost, innovative space vehicles that can tap into all of this. Very good. Thank you, Dan. So Ramon, you represent industry, and so from your perspective, how will these investments in lunar infrastructure create new opportunities for commerce? Yeah, thank you for the question. So it, it just provides a win-win relationship. I, I think a very clear one. The government gets to access some of the most innovative and cost-effective solutions from the industry, and the industry gets the chance to innovate and create those solutions, and also for new companies to demonstrate themselves solving some of the hardest problems. So historically, government has been uh, the spear of innovation for the space industry. Nobody has a doubt of that. But in parallel, we've seen how capitalism, commercial companies, and competition 
uh, has, has been an environment where technology has evolved uh, at a faster pace than ever before. So I think these new models that are being proposed and, and are already in place in some cases right now are pretty much taking the best of each side. They, they create the drive from the government to go and solve some of these largest challenges for, uh, for the humanity, uh, which would be quite risky to, to take on uh, by themselves for commercial companies. Um, but they don't tell them exactly how to do it. So they allow an environment in which the commercial companies are able to innovate to their full potential and the, type, the way these contracts are set, it also promotes that they do, that they do that trying to achieve the lowest cost so that they don't only do the mission once, but they achieve a sustainable business. Uh, and I think that is the key. That is, that is the, the, uh, the vehicle so that we don't just go once to the moon uh, uh, as a great achievement, but actually we go, we stay, uh, and we find out new business models, and we really uh, have the chance to finally go to the next frontier uh, uh, of space exploration, not just the moon, but into deep space, with the potential to create the, the, the largest value that uh, has ever been created. At the end of the day, um, we have some limitations of resources on the Earth. There is no such limitations as we build the capabilities to, uh, to be able to access everything we have in the solar system. Yeah, thank you very much. So I'm going to go to the audience and uh, have an excellent question for any of the panelists that would like to field it. How can we ensure that aspiring space nations can benefit from such infrastructure that they otherwise may not have access to? Anybody that wants it. Uh, and uh, aspiring nations, yes. Uh, emerging spacefaring countries. Uh. So it's very cool. Yeah. Um, so emerging uh, space agencies and emerging countries, so where we are in, in APAC, you, you've heard that um, there is the APR SAF um, conference, which is really dedicated to the Asia-Pacific um, regions. Um, so we are getting more and more involved in, uh, in this forum. We're also hosting the APR SAF in 2024. Um, so that's a chance here to, uh, to have a biggest role and, and focusing the agenda items that's going to be discussed there. We're doing already a lot with New Zealand. Uh, we also just launched a program with India, uh, the International Space Initiative uh, with, in, with India, where um, we encourage co Australian companies to cooperate with Indian companies to deliver some projects. Uh, so this has been uh, oversubscribed. I wish we had a, a bigger budget so we could fund uh, more, uh, more, more projects uh, that we've received. Um, and we, we are really having some very constructive uh, discussions uh, around the, the, the region. We're also trying to see how we can help inspiring uh, our neighboring um, Na our neighbor um, countries um, for STEM uh, education. Um, I was discussing with uh, Jim um, Green yesterday about his metaverse uh, school that he's doing. I think this is, a, I think tomorrow morning is a, he has a talk to, uh, along this and, and I invite everybody to listen to this because it, uh, it looks fantastic. And I would allow a lot of people who don't have the chance to, uh, to get exposed to everything that space can bring um, and, and get inspired and, and, and start uh, envisaging some, some career in, uh, in STEM. Um, and maybe the last thing I will mention, we've, um, we've done with NASA JPL um, the first uh, round of sending some uh, First Nation students uh, to do a, an internship um, in NASA JPL uh, for 10 weeks. Uh, so they are actually over there. Um, and that's important for us to be able to um, open the door that we have through the um, the relationship we have with other agencies so that um, our neighboring countries but also our First Nation uh, students uh, can take opportunities like this. So um, we, we're, we're doing good. Thank you. All right, maybe I'll add two things. One is um, provide your voice to agencies like ours, including at NASA. And we've given you, I think I commend our current NASA leadership for making sure we allow ways to get your voice heard by our teams, and specifically our architecture teams. If you want to influence 
infrastructure, the architecture, we have provided you a mechanism. We call that the architecture concept review, ACR process, where there's that website I mentioned, nasa.gov slash architecture, where we are asking for your input. We are releasing documents on that website, and I will tell you from the inside, NASA senior leaders like Jim Free take this very seriously. We are putting these documents out there. We're hosting workshops with international, communi international communities, other government agencies, commercial industry to get their voice and input into our, our, our architecture process. And every year we're committed to hear your voice, to solicit your input, to, to incorporate that input into our architecture plans, and that's, that's one thing I would mention. And the other thing is to the point of how do we explore more sustainably, more ethically, and actually our office about a few weeks ago released a report on ethical and, pol and um, sustainability implications of our exploration campaign. And so I think that's also very unique in this way of how we're going back to the moon as we're, as we're trying to solicit voices from different organizations. That actual report was a synthesis of a workshop we had where we invited First Nations and others to provide us input into what we're doing at NASA. And I we look forward to doing more of that uh, listening in terms of the different voices that are out there in our community to help inform our architectural decisions, which I think is kind of a cool thing beyond just the technical analysis. We're looking at the stakeholder community because that's ultimately one of the reasons why we're doing all this. So. Very good. Yeah, I, I want to point out a slightly different aspect about the infrastructure. And there is a huge infrastructure that's been invested uh, into by NASA, by ESA, by all the spacefaring nations uh, that we don't always recognize. And one example would be the Gaia Starbase that was uh, recently estimated, where we have these um, stars now estimated very precisely in the sky. That was an investment that improves our ability to do so many other tasks um, uh, in space in terms of accurate navigation, in terms of um, identifying uh, uh, you know, the characteristics of targets and the like. Similarly, NASA's investments in the ephemeris, uh, in ephemeris development uh, is free to everyone uh, and all nations can take advantage of it. I, I think there are also some, very, some future uh, investments that are being considered. I was just on a review panel for a, a lunar sensor network, creating like a GPS system at the moon. If something like that is developed, uh, suddenly uh, anyone that can get a spacecraft there at potentially lower cost can leverage this knowledge and, and do um, much more than they could otherwise. Yeah, that's great. So I'd like to come back to something that AC started with, and Aud, I know you're very passionate about sustainability on the moon. If we think about what this portends, there are going to be many more players, some commercial, some scientific, some government, how do we maintain uh, an environment, a lunar environment, that is sustainable? I don't know. I think about that from the technology perspective and how technology can help in that question. And one of the things I think about are um, uh, in-situ resource utilization, uh, you know, leveraging resources on the lunar surface in the Artemis context. But I also think about uh, things like um, safe spaces, landing zones, uh, you know, when these landers from some of the small landers from Astrobotic Intuitive Machines, Firefly and Draper land on the lunar surface, they kick up uh, uh, plumes that could affect other spacecraft. And now we have much larger landers from SpaceX and Blue Origin that will have an even larger effect in terms of the plumes. So this is a problem in terms of how we land on the moon because we're landing uh, multiple times over the next decade. So one of the things I think about are, let's say, landing pads. You know, uh, we have recently invested uh, over $10 million in uh, a tipping point contract from our Space Technology Mission Directorate with, with Redwire. Uh, and that contract will, will look at technologies that could include developing landing pads. And if we had landing pads, all these landers will be landing and the effects of them to, uh, to the lunar environment, to other activities on the lunar surface will be substantially reduced. So that's a way of how a technology investment in terms of landing pads can help actually impact better exploration and I would say more sustainable exploration. So that's one of the ways I think linking technology investment to um, this more amorphous metric of sustainability or ethical exploration uh, kind of can be matched. That's one of, the, one of the ways I think about it. Very 
significant. If we can continue this, Odd, how do we keep the lunar environment sustainable? I'm very happy you're asking this question because that's probably the first thing we started to think about five, five years ago when the agency was created. Um, one of our pillars is to be responsible. Um, and I could talk about sustainability for one hours, but I'm going to try to keep it short. Um, so we are, we're looking at sustainability in, and we're developing a, a, a blueprint around this. Sustainability is on Earth, how we can use space to help being sustainable on Earth using PNT, EU and, and other applications. How can we sus be sustainable in orbit, uh, looking at colli collision av avoidance, uh, making sure that um, you have a, a plan for end of life of your, of your satellites, and then sustainability on the moon, around the moon and beyond. And, and I have to say, yesterday I listened to a couple of panels here and they all mentioned sustainability and I'm very glad because five years ago um, nobody wanted to talk about it. When you look at uh, the previous session, there was a, a, a map of the moon showing all the CLEPS missions and where they're going to go. Part of me is super excited, but part of me is like, what's going to happen to all these landers and rovers at end of life? And really that, that freaks me out. So we are designing our rover now, and we are thinking, what can we do right now to try to be sustainable or to try to apply some best practice because you have to think about that at design level um, not not later um, and that open a lot of very interesting discussion that we're having with our two consortia who are currently doing uh, the design of this rover um, we're having conversation with the european commission who is looking at circular economy what does that mean and you know that they're telling us if you share the bill of material of your rover and, and highlighting the material that could be reused at some point and publish that, making sure that we can access this system or subsystem that are part of material that can be reused, so design them so they are easily dismantable. Um, but also try to be interoperable with other missions, so if a rover is in trouble, the other one can help him um, or help her, whatever you want to call it. Um, so looking at all these, all these things. Um, another one is maybe thinking, what's, once my lander has done his mission, can it be part of a bigger infrastructure we are, we are building? Like, can it be a relay uh, for, I don't know, a wireless network that we are building? And all this conversation, uh, we need to have them now, and we have to have them now all together. Um, all these technical solutions that we're going to um, have are going to inform policies and regulation that we're going to do very soon, I hope, because before doing regulation policies, we need to show that there is a solution to address that and, and to be compliant with them. Um, and maybe one last thing I would say, you may remember that um, sustainability was around LEO uh, con uh, constellation first, we're not talking about LUNA, um, but you may remember AIAA did um, a best practice guidelines, very small document, they did that with SpaceX, Iridium and OneWeb, and they shared very openly with everyone who wants to read the document what they've done to try to do constellation in a, in a sustainable manner. And we're looking at doing something similar with all the um, lander and, and rover designer, manufacturer, what can we share together to, to do a similar uh, booklet um, to share be best practice for, with the rest of the world. And we need to have this conversation right now. Yes, thank you, Odd. So we're running out of time. There's some, some wonderful questions from the audience, including one for uh, Odd uh, uh, regarding the Australia's rover, where will it land? I want to encourage you to come and, and, and find the panelists after this session you can ask more questions there. Perhaps we can meet out outside. But now we have just a, a moment or two left. In 30 seconds, from an industry perspective, Ramon, what, is the, what are your final words? What would you like to share? Um, I, I think industry perspective is this is the most exciting time to be part of the space industry. The, the, the vehicles that are provided by government, the ways in which they're encouraging us, to, uh, to do new things, bigger things, and, and the traction that that provides to actually do uh, uh, sustainable commercial businesses. Uh, it, it is just the, the most exciting time in terms of the goals that we have to go back to the moon, to go beyond the moon, uh, bring humans for first time to another planet, uh, and all the tools that are provided by the advancement in technology. So, Let's just do it. We just need uh, more of us. So let's encourage new generations to, to join this exciting industry, which is not just exciting now, but it has the potential to be really 
one of the largest and, and one of the biggest value creation that has happened in the history of humanity. Yes, thank you, Ramon. And Dan, your final words. Any last words? Um, I, I just want to point out again the, um, uh, what the universities can bring to, the, to this whole question of infrastructure and exploration. Uh, first of all, I, I know for a fact that everyone here has gone through a university. So we are the, the institutions that create the people that go on to be astronauts, be engineers, and the like. Um, but I also think that we've played a huge role in innovation in terms of uh, sensor developments, technique developments. Um, and I, I think in the future, I, I think the universities have to learn how to collaborate with each other a little more effectively. Um, in, in the U.S. At, at least, and I think elsewhere, we often have the, you know, sort of the football mentality of what, you know, which, which university is going to beat which university. And uh, I don't think that's a pathway to real success. I think collaboration. And I know Arizona State and the University of Colorado have been uh, discussing this and trying to figure out ways to move forward uh, supporting each other and then probably having a much larger impact in the future. Very good. Thank you. All your last words. Yeah, I forgot to uh, invite you all um, to Sydney in IEC 2025. We are very, very excited about that. And guess what? The theme is about sustainable sustainability. So it's a, su a sustainable space for a resilient Earth. Um, we don't want to only talk about sustainability. We want to demonstrate some actions that you all have taken in whatever endeavor you're doing uh, in space. Um, and we really want to show that this is a problem we can all solve. Um, so you have two years to think about how you can demonstrate that you are doing space in a sustainable manner. Um, and we are looking forward to uh, listen to what you have to propose. Um, so we have a, a small booth. Um, please pass by and, uh, and be ready because it's going to be a, a great IEC. Thank you. They see. Yeah, uh, I think in the theme of this talk, I will leave the audience with two things I, I am personally excited about. The next decade will be incredible. Let me give you two snapshots of why it's going to be incredible. Uh, we are investing at NASA in crewed lunar landers from SpaceX and Blue Origin. And I do not think the public, domestically and internationally, knows the advanced technologies that are in those two landers. Those are both single stage landers different than Apollo in terms of the architecture, that both rely on cryogenic fluid management that essentially are propellant depot-based crude lander architectures. So that is the investment we're making in partnership with these two companies that will be enabled, and that will create incredible opportunities to leverage that technology. The other investment NASA is making with industry, and once again, a public-private partnership, is we are maturing with Nokia Bell Labs in the United States, a 4G LTE lunar surface comms network. You know, if you want 4K video from an astronaut four and a half kilometers away to the lunar, lunar lander that they came from, you're going to need a high bandwidth link. And we're leveraging the terrestrial investments in 4G LTE with Nokia to demonstrate that. And we're about to demonstrate that on an uncrewed lander with intuitive machines. And so once again, these public-private partnerships are enabling massive changes in architectures and massive changes in technologies to enable capabilities I don't think we would have imagined in the 1960s. So it's going to be an incredible decade uh, with these partnerships. Well said and great parting words. So please join me in thanking the panelists.
spectrum and sustainability, pillars for connecting people on Earth. I'm Audrey Allison with the Center for Space Policy and Strategy from the Aerospace Corporation. Now, I, I realize the title for this GNF session is a tad lofty and quite broad, but it's actually meant to be that way because in 2023, we have new leadership in our two main United Nations organizations that are leading us in outer space activities, namely the International Telecommunication Union, ITU, and we have the United Nations Office of Outer Space Affairs, and now we have this new leadership coming into office in the same year, and it's an opportunity to address these, these issues that concern all of us. So our purpose at this GNF this afternoon is to launch a broader discussion of today's issues that we've been discussing at the session so far, and the opportunities ahead, in particular reference to our UN organizations. Uh, what can we do in these organizations to help perhaps find solutions to some of these intractable problems, or at least, you know, start a path towards a solution. So we're very pleased to have with us today a, a great panel, including the brand new director, Ardi Halamaini, of the United Nations Outer Office of Outer Space Affairs. Next to her, from the ITU, we have Jorge Sicorossi, who is a senior engineer in the ITU's Radio Communication Bureau. Next to Jorge, we have Holger Krah, who is the head of space safety program um, at the European Space Agency. Uh, and so we'll have a space agency perspective on, uh, for our discussion. And from Amazon, we have Johan Bernard. He is head of EU Digital Connectivity Public Policy. Uh, and so it's great to get the uh, private sector perspective as part of this conversation and also to have the view from one of our major, soon to be major, uh, LEO commercial space operators. So welcome to all of you. We're really thrilled to, for you to join us today. So uh, let's start with Artie. And I, you know, I appreciate you are brand new in your position. So um, this is rather a perspective some of the questions we'll discuss today. But why don't you tell us a little bit about your initial plans and your priorities that you want to achieve as the director of UNUSA? Thank you, Audrey. Um, thanks for inviting me to participate in this panel. Um, it's only my second IAC, and Audrey was the reason I went to the first one last year, and you're the reason again that I'm here. So. Um, I know everybody wants the answer to that question, but this is my third week in the job, <laughs> so it may be a little premature. Um, but especially with my background in industry, I know that there is a lot, uh, a lot of hopes and aspirations pinned to my appointment here. Um, and for now, I'm trying to understand different perspectives. That means engaging with member states, uh, engaging with the international community, engaging with industry uh, from a new perspective, uh, not as my members, but now as stakeholders. Um, and of course, engaging with space agencies as well um, to see what they, where they feel that UNUSA has done uh, a good job so far, where they feel there could be areas for improvement, and understanding most of all, what are the priorities that member states um, want to see. Um, with the feedback that I get, I'm going to put together a strategy, um, but it must be an informed strategy so that we are responding to the wishes of our stakeholders. Um, but from what I've seen so far and what I saw of this organization and COPUS 
from the perspective of industry. Um, I know that the first priority has to be uh, ensuring the role, the relevance, and most importantly, the impact of um, USA and of COPUS, um, and that we show that through the work that is being done. Um, in order to do that, we're going to look at the different indicators which we're receiving, not only from the feedback, but also uh, looking at the direction that has been set by the Space 2030 Agenda, adopted by UNGA in uh, 2021. That really puts space for the SDGs at its core. Um, the fact that space has been recognized by the Secretary General um, as a global priority when we look in the preparations to this uh, summit of the future, which will take place in New York next September. Um, there are eight policy briefs on global priorities and space is one of them. Um, and next, uh, increasing multi-stakeholder engagement. Um, now, member states are the decision makers, but they cannot take the right decisions if those decisions are not informed by the developments and the progress and the innovations that are happening within industry. Um, and finally, I think we must tell a far better story outside the space sector uh, of what we actually do um, as, as USA, as COPUS, um, what we do in terms of capacity building to kickstart space economies and to build resilience. Um, for member states. Now, we need to do this because we are the custodians of space for the SDGs. As an office, that is what we are there for. And so I see it as our responsibility to make sure that member states and the international community um, can realize the concrete benefits uh, that come from space technology, data, and services. Um, space has got such a huge potential to move the needle on some of the global challenges, whether it's universal uh, primary education, social inclusion, climate change, uh, disaster management, more efficient transport, uh, and so on and so on. Uh, we already have partnerships with space agencies, with industry and civil society across um, the world. We cover 20 programs and 15 of the sustainable development goals. Um, but it's clear that as an office and as COPUS, we still need to do more. So that is kind of outlining the approach that I'm taking so far. Thank you. Well, it seems like you've had a very good first three weeks with all that. But I'm going to ask one more thing beyond the SDGs, the space uh, the, uh, development goals, but what do you think COPUS can be doing to ensure space sustainability in the near term? Because that is also a, a, a huge need that we see in the world. Sure. I mean, most recently, COPUS, I think, as, as many people know, have delivered the long-term sustainability guidelines by consensus, which is quite an achievement. Um, and if you take a closer look at them, uh, they cover so much of what we need to see happen in concrete terms in member states um, and things which are not necessarily happening today. Uh, for example, not all operators are sharing their ephemerides data. Um, when we know that the more data shared, the safer we can make space. Um, Pre-launch conjunction assessments are not a capability that every member state have. Uh, so we need to find ways of making sure that these, these things happen. Um, so there's plenty of work to be done for COPUS in terms of implementation. Um, and and COPUS's role in driving this process has been underscored by the space policy brief. Um, there are different activities under, underway to support this. Um, COPUS has established a new uh, five-year working group on LTS, on the Long-Term Sustainability Guidelines, um, under the leadership of India. Uh, and they are focusing on implementation, capacity building, and possible new guidelines. Um, right now, member states are discussing active debris removal, mega constellations, cyber safety, and in-orbit servicing. So, you know, the, the major topics there. And I know it's slow, but COPUS continues to lead the international debate on uh, space sustainability, and it is still the fastest mechanism, as, as ironic as that may sound, that we have to arrive at a, a consensus outcome. Um, we're supporting member states in acquiring the expertise to implement the guidelines um, at national level. 
Um, this is an initiative which is driven by the UK. And we already held in 2023 three dedicated workshops to go through the guidelines, explain them better to member states, respond to questions, and so on. Um, we're also working hard to enhance the registration practices. Um, not, you, you, I, I find it hard to believe, but not every member state realizes that they need to register their objects with the UN. So we see countries who may have launched based on a STEM initiative, a CubeSat or something, and by virtue of doing that, they actually become a launching state with certain obligations. Um, but they have not realized that they have acquired this status that comes with certain, uh, certain obligations. Um, in fact, only 88% of all the launches um, that have taken place have actually been registered with the UN. And uh, registration is, is understanding who is who in space, and it's key to ensuring sustainability um, and to making sure that sustainability is really enshrined in the national um, licensing and authorization process. Well, thank you so much. I think we'll turn to Holger to uh, get the um, ESA perspective and maybe to talk a little bit more about what you, ESA believes that can be accomplished using COPUAS or the, the ITU um, in, in addition to the work you do to um, build space sustainability practices. Thank you. Yeah, thanks uh, for having me on the panel and good afternoon. Um, indeed, space sustainability and space debris are an issue that ESA is following for a long time. And I could maybe start out with explaining a bit the situation that we are in today uh, in space. So we, we have remainders of space missions uh, and an accumulation of space objects where we're talking about one million objects that have a size of a cherry or more traveling at orbital velocities meaning 25,000 kilometers in an hour. Um, and that means upon uh, hitting any other space system uh, in the environment, it would mean a total loss of that system. ESA is an operator. We fly 20 spacecraft. Um, and we know what it means to fly in the environment of today. Uh, it means doing an, an avoidance maneuver roughly every two weeks. It's a reality for every space operator uh, in these days. We also almost lost the space system uh, because it was impacted by a piece of just two millimeters. And that already creates such a momentum that, uh, you know, we, we were producing debris just by getting impacted and therefore producing fragments that are now in space causing other missions to do avoidance maneuvers <laughs> uh, to avoid our own fragments. And now we are living in this very, very small entangled environment. Um, and ESA has set up, um, well, not only ESA, uh, many, many agencies and also um, nations have um, agreed um, on what we call guidelines. And IEDC is a body, and of course the United Nations is a body of producing um, such mitigation guidelines, debris prevention guidelines. And they all boil down to very simple principles. One is prevent your spacecraft from breaking up by releasing residual fuel or other energy sources. And the other one is get your space system out of space when it's no longer used by doing a disposal maneuver. Now that's good, uh, and it would even work if we would do it. <laughs> uh, but if you look at uh, what we do in reality, and by we I mean really everybody, it's a, it's a global problem, there's nobody better or worse than the other, you find that a bit more than half uh, of the spacecraft actually manage to do that. And that's not, not only because they are ignorant, um, it's also because it's difficult. We are, having, we are speaking of technical systems that can fail at the, at the end of a mission and not be able to do these kind of measures, disposal and passivation, even if they're designed for it. So ESA has set up a space safety program and member states of ESA have attributed roughly 250 million to develop technology to overcome uh, this problem. And what is this technology? It is making passivation mitigation fail safe the orbiting kits that you can launch, that you can launch with the space system, um, providing additional redundancy on board so that you can do a disposal even if the system is no longer active, um, and also active removal, which means going up there, uh, grabbing an object and bringing it down. Uh, of course, an expensive thing to do, but maybe um, an interesting thing to do when it comes to future policy. Um, future policy might foresee 
something that you would do and expect in every national park. The stuff you bring in, you get it out again. And when, when you don't manage, ask the truck, the garbage truck to get it. And that's the active removal. Uh, so it, it could be mandatory. And then it would be used more manifold way. And then also market mechanisms would start to work and we would get also cheap emissions um, to do that. Now, this is something we are embarking on in ESA very heavily, and uh, Josef Aschbacher, the Director General, who am I replacing today, is, is, is extremely fond of an idea of moving towards a zero debris approach, meaning to have this principle of uh, uh, making sure that your own missions clear space after the, after the mission is, is established um, for, ESA, for ESA, but of course we are calling on the community to do similar steps. And uh, the United Nations, you were asking the role of United Nations and ITU as the way I see it. Of course, the United Nations is the greenhouse of, of future um, guidelines. We are having the long-term sustainability guidelines and they're going in a second step of further, of further maturing these guidelines, bringing additional ones on. And I think we can stimulate this process from a technical agency because when the technology is not there, you will not dare to move into further, more ambitious guidelines. So the technology must be there and must be demonstrated. And the ITU can also play a very important role because the ITU has all the mechanisms to coordinate the use of space when it comes to frequency. But space itself is also a limited resource. It's just not so apparent like the frequency spectrum is a limited resource. But we are working hard with the academic sector in Europe to make also the use of space measurable, to quantify how much space is used by a mission. And it's more than just the body dimensions. It's more, you need more space to fly a mission. You can agree um, technically with all agencies on a consensus or that. And when this is available, you have a tool to coordinate also the use of space. When there's an understanding how much or big the capacity of space is, yeah, then you can apply exactly the same mechanisms um, as for frequency coordination, as a voluntary uh, coordination effort. And I, I'm very confident that this would work, but we need to establish um, a mathematical concept for that first, and this is, this is well on the way. I leave it there for the moment. <laughs> Thank you very much, Helga. Um, let's turn to Jorge. Uh, we, we were talking with Artie about the sustainable development goals. The S is sustainable, I had to remember that. Uh, but one of the areas that's a high priority for our new Secretary General of the ITU, Doreen Bogdan Martin, is uh, con connectivity. And she's very excited about the role of space in, in bridging this gap, that this enduring gap of, of people who are not connected to the internet. Um, we've made some progress uh, over the past year, but the, it's still, uh, 2.6 billion people who are not connected. So, um, Jorge, I, I, I appreciate you uh, coming to our panel today. Uh, what can, can you tell us about the ITU's role uh, in this area and uh, what, what's next in this space? Thank you. Sure. And good afternoon to everyone. Well, you know. I'm happy that you, you have mentioned the connectivity also in, in this panel because many times people are just focused on, of course, very important and exciting topics like uh, space exploration, but uh, we are forgetting that uh, the satellite communications is a large part of the space economy as well. And in order to have this uh, connectivity, as you are saying, and in order to have this space economy, we also need uh, this component of the spectrum. Uh, so, if you're coming back quickly uh, in history, 60 years ago, in fact, in 1963, we have the first conference in Geneva, which was uh, dedicated to uh, allocate frequency bands for space services. And since then, during these 60 years of space regulation, we have achieved what we have today, no? We have a thousand of sa uh, satellites uh, orbiting, and not only the Earth, but also going to deep space. And, well, that was thanks to our uh, let's say the vision of our uh, member states, which then together with the satellite industry could uh, manage to coordinate the frequencies and, and use them today. But uh, unfortunately, despite of all these efforts, uh, as you said well, uh, Audrey, there are still 2.6 billion of people in the earth which are not connected. And 
Uh, Dorin Bob de Martin, our Secretary General at ITU, just uh, before I was coming here, because well, she, she couldn't manage at the last moment, and she asked me to replace for this message where she was saying, well, let's try to, to see what we can do to go further and to connect all these uh, people which are offline. And for that, uh, of course, the terrestrial system has done a great job. We all have a, a mobile a network, we have fixed uh, services, but there are still areas which are not rich in, in, in the planet, no? And, and we believe, and, and that's why she put on her priority, that the satellite system, both GSO and non-GSO, can play a, a key role on that, no? in, in, in reaching these unserved areas. Uh, at the ITU, we have a set of initiatives, uh, including, for example, one which is called Partner to Connect, which is receiving kind of 100 millions of, of uh, dollars in, in terms of uh, pledges from the satellite industry, but also another project which is called GIGA, which is to connect the schools. So the idea is trying to connect all the schools through the internet. So these are two initiatives, and if we move more to the spectrum side, which is a little bit more my, my expertise, uh, we have, as, as you know, uh, the World Radio Conference, which is going to take place uh, this year in Dubai, in, in a few weeks from now. And certainly we have a set of agenda items dealing with the uh, new spectrum allocation for space services, which will uh, help us to connect uh, this and connect it. Just to mention a few, maybe we can mention the um, mobility application by NGSO satellite systems, like we have here in this panel. So, so uh, we will have also inter-satellite links, typically to connect uh, satellites in low orbit with higher orbits like GEO, just to relay uh, high uh, resolution images from, from Lee orbit to GEO and then back to the Earth. We will also have uh, initiatives to, to call for new uh, frequency bands for WRC27, typically for IoT, Internet of Things, but also for a new emerging technology we are seeing, which is direct-to-device. Until now, direct-to-device was implemented, started to be implemented in a kind of uh, trial version and now there is more and more understanding that they really need some frequency bands, and this is really going to, to be studied during the next four, four year cycle until WRC 27, and it's promising to be really also helpful technology to, to get this integration between satellite and, and terrestrial that we are all dreaming, right? So, and, and, and well, and reaching these, these areas which are not properly served today. So this is more or less in, in a few minutes uh, how we are trying to approach this. Well, thank you. Oops, is this on? Go. Here we go. Thank you so much uh, for that. Uh, let's turn to Johan, uh, who can probably s provide a, a supplemental, a complementary response as uh, a, 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 on behalf of Amazon Kuiper. You're about to launch your first satellites in your uh, LEO constellation. Uh, so uh, tell us. From a commercial perspective, what do you see ahead? And in particular, this World Radio Conference, what is its important to, importance to an, an, uh, an operator such as yourself? Yeah, thank you, Audrey, uh, for having me uh, here today. I must say I'm, I'm very glad to be here also because of the title you commented on, on, on the title of our panel. And, and the reason why I like it, it's because um, there is everything in there, right? There is what we are trying to do, and there is also it, it also speaks to the ingredients that are needed to do it, right? And so, first, a few words about what we are trying to do. Um, you, you know that Amazon uh, strives to be the most customer-centric company in the world, and in terms of connectivity, connecting people, there is a lot still to be done, right? Um, Jorge has said it, at global level, more than two billion people still unserved or underserved, but that's also true in, in my geography, Europe, where I belong. I saw last week the EU Commission published its first report on the digital decade, and uh, what uh, I could read in that report is that 27% of European households today still lack a good uh, gigabit uh, fixed connection. Um, uh, one out of five in dense cities uh, still do not have, have access to 5G. So it's, it's really everywhere. It's tens of millions of households in Europe, billions in the world, who are affected by the digital divide because of the lack of connectivity. So this is exactly what we're trying to do with uh, Project Kuiper, to uh, provide affordable 
broadband connectivity to unserved and underserved uh, people. And we do that with a low Earth orbital uh, satellite, which will have 3,200 uh, satellites. So that's the intent, and that's what we want to do, uh, starting from the people, from the customers. And so what do we need to get there? Well, I think essentially we need three things, right? We need innovation. Uh, we need a sustainable space and we need spectrum and good regulations. So let me talk very briefly to these three pillars as uh, you state in the panel uh, title. Uh, innovation, right? Um, we are well on the way. Uh, Amazon has committed more than 10 billion uh, USD to Project Kuiper. Uh, we are, uh, you said it, uh, uh, preparing to launch our proto flight uh, later this week, hopefully. Uh, so that's a great moment, but uh, we are working with the entire industry. We have also committed, uh, contracted with Ariane Espace, uh, working with uh, the European Space Agency on 18 launches uh, with Ariane 6. So that's really uh, not uh, us only, but working with the entire uh, industry. So that's investment and innovation. It's, uh, we have obviously an influence on that. We can make it and we're making it. The second one, however, is to have a safe space and to preserve a safe space uh, for our operations. And here again, uh, I want to um, acknowledge uh, the work done by UN USA uh, on um, promoting the standards, and you have talked to it, um, uh, on, on promoting the best practices across the industry globally, because this is a global issue. But as a company, we also have uh, the possibility to, to take action, and this is what we do. We do it at several levels. We do it at um, the level of the satellite design. Uh, we have made the important decision that uh, all of our satellites will, be, uh, will have autonomous propulsion so that uh, we can operate them at any stage of their lifetime. Uh, we have also designed the system in a way that is sustainable with um, uh, three layers um, at 590, 610, and 630 kilometers that are close uh, to uh, the Earth and therefore easy for deorbiting, and that also clearly separated uh, to avoid uh, issues. And finally, we do that also in the course of our operations uh, with um, communication uh, sharing uh, with other operators to avoid collisions, right? So we, we, we can work on our, at our level to make uh, space safer, and that's what we do. And finally, the third ingredient that is needed is obviously spectrum. And here, uh, obviously, it has been discussed a, a minute ago, there is progress to, to make. Why do we need um, spectrum and good regulations on spectrum? It's because uh, the rules uh, that are in place, the EPFD rules, have been, um, have been determined 25 years ago at a time when the technology was different, uh, the uh, spectrum management uh, was also different, and so we have an opportunity to revisit those rules uh, at a time when we realize that optimizing the spectrum can make a huge difference. I, I saw a study that was recently published that uh, explains uh, how it could make a difference in terms of uh, welfare of several tens of billion uh, of US uh, of, of dollars uh, to, to humanity to all of these households that are underserved that I was mentioning uh, before right across the globe so we have to look at those rules and uh, to see if they are still adapted to the context uh, of today with new players uh, new needs also from the population and we have that opportunity. Obviously, there are a lot of aspects to be taken into account, um, which is why it has to be studied and uh, to, to study um, the, the, the possibility of adjusting those EPFD limits. Uh, we need to put an agenda item at the uh, World Ra Radio Conference uh, next month, actually, in order to study uh, that option in the perspective of the next one in 2027. So this is really uh, what we look forward uh, to doing and we are happy to continue working with ITU and uh, with all uh, the institutions to get uh, to those adaptations that are needed to provide good connectivity to the people. Thank you.
Thank you so much. As we have such success and growth in the satellite industry, one of the consequences is having to share the spectrum in the orbits with more and more systems. So it's not just sustainability of space itself, but sustainability of the spectrum. How can we use the spectrum most effectively and efficiently with the most number of services yet not have harmful interference. So that's what the World Radio Conference will be addressing. It's a tough issue. So I wanted to mention, we will endeavor to take a question or two from the audience if you have one. We've got this Slido app running, so uh, feel free. Uh, but in the meantime, let's, let's talk about, it's not just the commercial space people who need access to spectrum. Uh, it, in addition to space resources in order to carry out their missions. But it's also, uh, and more from a space agency perspective, it's all these cislunar activities we've been talking about in this very room these last few hours, deep space exploration. It all also needs dedicated and uh, assured access to its, its telecommunications links as well. So I wanted to turn back to Jorge about what activity you have been seeing in the ITU to support these developments we've been hearing about here. Thank you. Yes, indeed. Uh, as you said, the, the innovation is not only happening in LEO, but uh, from the space uh, agencies as well. And in particular, now we are seeing in this Congress a lot of activities uh, regarding the moon. So uh, at the I ITU, WRC uh, Forum, in realidad, Regarding the moon, what we are seeing is that until now uh, uh, there was, as you know, one actor mainly. Yeah? And, and now we have seen that, uh, well, not only China, also India just landed and in the south, near the south pole of the moon. So there is more than one actor, and all of them will need to, to use, obviously, radio frequencies for, for their activities. And this is being brought to, to the ITU as well, to the conference. Uh, until now, they were using mainly what we call space operations and space uh, research, uh, deep space research uh, operation services frequencies, which are kind of limited. But from now on, from the moment that they want to deploy rovers plus the base station, plus satellites orbiting the moon, plus then back to Earth, there is a need for coordination, not only within one agency, but between several agencies. And this is what is going to be discussed as well in the next conference in Dubai, uh, identifying some frequency events for, for, uh, for activities on the moon. And, and um, I, I have seen some of them, some of these proposals, which start from 400 megahertz to 8 gigahertz, and also k band no, to be used. So this is going to, to be studied also in the next four-year cycle, and hopefully it has to be achieved for, for the benefit of all those uh, member states that they want to, to make benefit of the moon. Uh, there is one more activity or discussion which will take place, which is uh, concerning radio astronomy, now I remember. And this is just to protect the quiet zone of the moon as well. So these are the two main uh, issues for, for concerning the moon. Thank you. Thank you. And Holger, of course, ESA has a lot of planned activities to the moon and beyond. Uh, and, uh, and it's your organization participating in some of these preparations at the ITU and for the World Radio Conference? Uh, yes, absolutely. We are deeply involved in this. Uh, we have um, 20 space missions in Earth orbit and uh, another 10 on, uh, on interplanetary uh, orbits flying and planned. Uh, and of course, a number of ground stations. So also these need to be coordinated. Uh, so there's an, a very active group uh, in ESA contributing uh, to these coordination efforts. And uh, yes, of course, also the cislunar uh, efforts that are going on. And, and I agree that we, we probably do not see so much of an issue for the communication to the spacecraft uh, around Moon, for which you have um, the research satellite services uh, frequency band uh, allocation. Mm -hmm. And also for the space-to-space -space links, there's already the inter-satellite link services, so this is probably fine. Uh, it gets interesting when we come to operations on the lunar surface and the communication that is to be used uh, there. So where a lot of wireless applications are used uh, and that of course is heritage from, from, from terrestrial applications and then there's an inclination to use uh, similar frequency bands and that of course care must be taken that we do not overlap, uh, you said it, with, uh, with S-band uh, communication. 
or with the KA band, which we, which we use, for example, for the communication to uh, space weather satellites and the data download from, from weather satellites or from Lagrange point or in interplanetary missions. So um, we are contributing to this and we are, we are watching it. And uh, we are also contributing to a group that is called the Space Frequency Coordination Group, uh, which, is, um, which is a platform. Uh, it's actually a useful platform for agencies to coordinate the use of frequency also for the lunar uh, and interplanetary missions. And it's also open for non-members. Um, non so uh, that, that allows for some rapid conclusions uh, over there. And we are contributing to both. Yeah. I heard they had a lovely meeting recently in Toulouse. <laughs> That's FCG. <laughs> So let's turn back to Artie um, for uh, another perspective question. And I hope to, we'll, we'll bring this, this next time we meet with Doreen, uh, the Secretary General of the ITU, we will ask her this question as well. But are, do you foresee there are, are ways that ITU, UNUSA, and COPUIS can, can work together in the future more than they already have, bringing together their respective strengths and perspectives to accomplish more in these growing areas um, and become more than the sum of their parts. And under this new leadership, this is the question that's on my mind. It's actually a really good point to make, um, not just because Doreen and I are both new, but you know, when you look back historically at uh, the genesis of COPUS and USA and also of ITU, both of them have satellites and space actually at their heart. Uh, so we both have uh, a long history um, of, of setting the stage, coordination for member states, and putting the frameworks in place that, that help um, uh, all of these space applications, satellite applications, uh, move forward. Um, I would say that the ITU, I, I welcome the, the fact that the ITU has already started looking at space sustainability. There was a paper in October 22 um, I believe, which looked at synergies for outer space sustainability, um, which really was very, very poignant in, in highlighting the different roles. Um, I have to say the ITU has got the toughest job possible in trying to figure out how to manage interference between different systems in different orbits that might use the same spectrum. That is really tough. Um, uh, at, and I know that at WRC 23, we're only, they're also going to look at um, orbital tolerances uh, as, it, as it impacts spectrum management for NGSOs. Uh, so I'm sure that's going to influence the work of the ITU as well. Um, both of them, serious questions, must find solutions, but the answers are not obvious at all. Um, while while COPUS uh, has worked on the guidelines, when you look at them, I must say you can see that they have been informed by expert groups um, also involving industry because some of them are really operational and tangible. Um, but COPUS is dealing with implementing those guidelines, possible new guidelines and capacity building. Um, going forward, it is my hope that we will do that in consultation with industry. Um, I think that an important point is that we both act as interlocutors for our member states. And even though the member states might be the same, the interlocutors are different. So the, the, the member state representatives who go to COPUS meetings and who USA interfe uh, interfaces with are not the same as the ITU. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we have a joint responsibility actually to bridge that gap and ensure the same level of understanding with our respective stakeholders on the different elements and angles that these challenges uh, present to us. Um, and I think in doing that, we effectively need to hold hands. Um, I know that ITU, the plenipotentiary meeting um, in 2022, asked the ITU specifically to leverage their relations with regulators and to work uh, to encourage licensing expertise and capacity building for NGSOs. Of course, this is new. So not only are these challenges of interference and so on, new questions for the ITU and implementing the guidelines, new questions for us, but when it comes to regulators, they have been consulting with industry. Help us, how do we license these NGSO systems, right? So um, 
we, we, between us, we have our work cut out. There is plenty to do, and I think an exchange of information, the feedback that the ITU gets uh, in those engagements on how to, how to uh, license uh, and deal with NGO NGSO systems will inform our work at COPUS and USA to see how far is it going, how, how well is that capacity building doing, where are there gaps, where do we need to step up, and, and vice, vice versa. As we interact with our interlocutors, we may also get feedback, which is very important for the ITU. One final, final point I would make on this is um, the filings that are made with the ITU are really important indicators of the trends and the level of interest that there is in investing in these systems. Even though many of those filings may be paper, paper satellites, maybe they don't uh, uh, result in tangible systems because operators can't raise the capex or they don't meet the bringing into use uh, deadlines or whatever, whatever. Um, uh, still, I think those indicators are not to be neglected. Um, and they're, they're an important sign for member states generally of the importance of this work and where, we, where and how we may need to step up. I don't know if there's a way to do any kind of matching uh, between the filings that the ITU sees and the actual registrations on USA side. Uh, that could be something where we should think further, I don't know. Um, at this point, remembering that even though ours are real, that there's no paper, paper registrations or that kind of thing, they're very real, but as I said earlier, it's not 100%, it's 88% of all satellites launched that are registered. But this is certainly an area where we have agreed earlier, we are going to dialogue, and, and where we definitely have to look closer because between us, we carry a very important joint responsibility. And it's funny you should bring that up because we were discussing that in one of the technical fora this morning. Uh, so uh, I'll tell you more about it later. <laughs> but Jorge, so could you give a response from the ITU perspective? I, I'm hearing exciting things. Well, on sustainability, I think we can spend much more time if we are allowed because it's really not only an exciting topic, but it's a need, no? As, as I heard sometimes, I think it was in, in the World Satellite Business Week in Paris, a couple of weeks ago, we were with Doreen there, and, and somebody was saying, well, space sustainability is not a science fiction, it's an operational need today. So it's not something that we can even afford to spend too much time to, to implement and so on. And I cannot agree more with the, uh, Arti on, on what she said about the cooperation. When you ask about the synergy, certainly, absolutely. Uh, we spoke a little bit uh, earlier to, to this meeting, and now we are seeing we are going to speak more also with with the different uh, partners with, with ESA, that they, they gave us very good ideas in terms of measuring capacity, if you wish, physical capacity with operators, with the industry. Um, so absolutely, there is a lot of room for synergy, not only room, but there is a need. Um, sometimes, if, if I may, since we have this opportunity uh, in, the, in this forum to, to say, some, some people may say, okay, what is the role or the mandate of this or that organization? Certainly, ITU has a responsibility of, of, of uh, ensuring the efficiency and reliability of the use of the spectrum. We are working from 60 years, as we said. But we cannot disconnect this from, from what is uh, sustainability, especially today. And uh, it, it's hard to imagine that we are going to use, to, to make an efficient use of the Lee orbit, for example, if we have a cluster of space debris there, if we don't have a clean environment. So there is a strong connection between what we are doing already today to ensure the efficient use of the spectrum orbit, plus trying to see, and I will say later, how a, a clean environment, no? Otherwise, it wouldn't be efficient. So that, that's one point, just because sometimes, uh, well, uh, it's part of the natural discussion. Uh, there is a point that Arti mentioned, which I really like, that there are different, even within one organization or one company, there may be different views sometimes, or different sectors. We have the spectrum people, we have the policy people, we have uh, more uh, people who are dealing with the flight dynamics, if you wish. And, and sometimes, not all of them are aware about the same thing, and, or they may have different views. And we have to be all in the same line. And this is a really nice point. It's not only between organizations. And, and we have noticed this through the, this year, just from January until now, how the operators have changed their mind in, in the sense of how to approach to recognize first that there is a need for this, 
and second to, to talk each other. No? So the, I think there is a lot of uh, already uh, advances in, in, in terms of best practices, uh, sometimes from space agencies, sometimes between the operators, but it's a kind of fragmented today, no? So, and mainly at, at industry level. It is. So when it's come to the picture of, of the government, still uh, a lot of uh, things to do. Um, and that's why the way we approach to this is, we, don't, we believe that this is not for one actor only, or one organization or company. It's, it should be a collaborative effort. It has to be a collaborative effort within the organization or company and also across the different sectors. Um, and, and, and for that, I would say that I'm, I'm happy to, to, to share uh, with you, in fact, one message from, from the U.S. Secretary General, is that she's really knowing this uh, need of today and what I have just uh, mentioned before. Uh, she's intending to, to call for a group of, of uh, different stakeholders uh, from the space ecosystem to, to talk about this and to try to, to deliver concrete things, normally short, medium term, because we really believe that it's, it's a, there is a need for that. And of obviously, UNOSA and the different uh, stakeholders has to be on board, and we are happy to, to be working together. I also hope, I, I just mentioned UNOSA, but uh, when I mean UNOSA, I mean also COPUS, mm -hmm. which is, they are doing also very, very intensive work, and it will be really a valuable contribution to the group. So we really have to be aligned on that. And, um, and then, well, finally, also to add that uh, at the next WRC and the Radio Assembly, there may be, almost 100% sure, some contributions from countries uh, and uh, proposals from uh, regional organizations to call for studies for, for space debris uh, mitigation measures So during the next four years. So different axes, but at one point, we are trying to put them all together hopefully within this platform we are saying, so we can work together because uh, otherwise all this uh, innovation we are seeing, not only on LEO, but also we have to grow, go through LEO to go to the moon, would be vanished, unfortunately, because of, of the lack of uh, clean space. No? So uh, we have listened a lot also in, in another uh, panel here of, about the need of sustainability, which looks like it's on the top of the agenda today. So thanks for the question. And we really, I hope we will continue after this panel uh, within different organizations and, and stakeholders. Thank right, you. exactly. Uh, well, we, we all look forward to hearing more about this uh, announcement and, and it will be exciting to see what the next year brings after the World Radio Conference. <laughs> Um, so this is, you know, the beginning of a, of a conversation that we hope continues throughout the week and, and afterwards. Uh, so thank you all. I'm afraid we have managed to run out of time, uh, so we'll have to conclude our session. But I really like to thank all of our participants and like to thank you all for, for, you, for coming uh, as well. So that's it. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back here. What a great way to conclude our IC 2023 Industry Day with such a cool topic. If you have a look what you see behind me and here on stage, then you understand what we are going to talk about. This highlight lecture is called, is titled Pioneering a Sustainable Earth Moon Ecosystem, the iSpace Journey to the Moon and it has been organized by iSpace. I would like to extend my sincere gratitude to iSpace, not only for organizing this exciting session, but also supporting us as a silver sponsor here, being here with a big team. Thank you very much, iSpace. It is now my great pleasure to call on stage the CEO of iSpace, Mr. Takeshi Hakamada. Please come up. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm very uh, pleased to have a session today, uh, but uh, it's not my session. As uh, Takeshi Hakamada, uh, founder of of iSpace, uh, well, the, our mission has been supported by the many people, especially our team members. So I'd like to uh, uh, provide the spotlight on the, our team members later, but let me uh, start off uh, from my uh, well, a uh, speech first. Uh, I started uh, iSpace uh, 13 years ago. And then uh, when I started this, uh, well, company a uh, couple years later, uh, one of the uh, team member asked me, what is your vision, Takis's vision? Why are you reading this activity? And then I need to find my answer. And then uh, I think that uh, that should be uh, more like not my own vision, but the vision everyone can agree on. And then I came up with the idea that expand the planet, expand the future, which means we want to extend our human presence into outer space. However, in order to do that, uh, we need to create a uh, sustainable ecosystem in space, economically feasible ecosystem. Otherwise, we cannot expect sustainable activity, especially uh, human living in space. So currently, uh, along with the uh, expand the planet, expand the future, our uh, mission is to create an uh, ecosystem, Cicerina ecosystem in space. And then in order to uh, create sound ecosystem, we believe that space resource utilization is going to be key uh, to lower the cost of the transportation and then also uh, encourage people uh, to do economical activities in space. And then especially uh, we have eye on the water resources on the lunar surface. Uh, once we can uh, create gas station in space, dividing water into hydrogen and oxygen, 
it's become prevalent uh, for the spacecraft, and uh, we can lower the transportation costs dramatically for the uh, uh, Mars missions in the future. But also, it's important to sustain the sustainability, uh, keep the sustainability of the Earth as well. Our current modern life has been supported many of the satellite infrastructure asset, and uh, our dependency to such a uh, asset is going to be uh, increased in the future. And the next question is how are we going to maintain such a space infrastructure in economically viable way? So the transport, reducing transportation costs, utilizing our resources, space resources is going to be key for the future. And then once we can create such a world, I believe that, uh, well, around 2040 or after 2040, uh, we can uh, envision that uh, 1,000 people living, working, creating economy from the moon. Of course, uh, we are a private company, so we need to do business. So we have uh, three services right now, uh, payroll service to the lunar surface, orbit, so on. And then also we're going to provide the data set uh, to our customers acquired during our mission. And then also we have partnership service. Uh, we uh, maximize our uh, marketing rights, uh, marketing op uh, opportunity for our customers. And uh, if you are interested, uh, please contact us. Uh, we are happy to discuss for your future mission. And then uh, most importantly, uh, in order to do this, a sustainable business, sustainable activity. Uh, we try to transform the way to do business, try to way to do uh, lunar exploration. Uh, we are conducting three missions. We have been conducting three missions simultaneously. Uh, we finished mission one, but still, uh, we are uh, before I uh, finish mission one. We initiate mission two and mission three uh, simultaneously. And then uh, the idea is to mitigate the risk uh, of the, uh, any incompletion of the mission one. Uh, still, we can accelerate the speed of the lunar exploration, lunar delivery service. Whatever happens, we can utilize our lesson learned from mission one to mission two, mission three immediately. In order to do that, we need to uh, secure the large funding. Uh, we are uh, securing uh, most of the funding private way. Uh, we have not have the uh, government uh, funding yet. So uh, it's purely commercial, uh, well, private uh, activities so far. And then uh, because of this, uh, I believe the continuity, uh, uh, we, our team is gathering uh, from the older world, literally saying, and then now we have uh, almost uh, 250 uh, employee, uh, our teammate uh, globally, uh, we have, and then um, a very great diversity, uh, including nationality, background, uh, so on. And then uh, I encourage this diversity because the uh, lunar exploration uh, uh, missions are required international partnership collaboration uh, pretty much. So uh, we want to uh, become the uh, living example of the international uh, cooperation, collaboration as a company. And then um, uh, first mission, uh, well, uh, we did very great job. And then um, I am leader of this company. So usually I'm going to speak about the, the mission. However, I like to today uh, welcome my teammate uh, to share uh, their experience uh, to you guys. And then uh, I want to uh, provide spotlight on them. And then I'd like to first uh, welcome Yoshi Hitachi. Uh, please come on stage. Okay, stage is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Hakamada-san. So, after serving as a GNC engineer in NEC Corporation in Japan, I was so attracted to Hakamada-san's vision and iSpace vision. That's how my story began. So I joined iSpace in two, uh, 2019. And um, I want to also talk a little bit more about our offices, our people, and 
what what we are doing, who you know the people who came together under Hakamasan's vision, Ice Space's vision, and how we are working to realize his vision now. So, as Hakamasan just mentioned, we have three offices globally in the world, and one of the biggest offices is in Tokyo, and Tokyo headquarter. This is the largest office, and it's located in Nihonbashi area, Tokyo. So that is actually located in the center of the Japan's economy, finance, and business. And Japan office has, at the moment, around 150 employees, and also growing. And we developed our first, we developed our Series One lander for Mission One. And at the moment, we are also developing the second Series One lander for Mission Two. And we also have an office in the U.S. located in Colorado, uh, Denver, Colorado. And this is the second largest office at the moment, and we have about 80 employees and working for, at the moment, for the Apex 1.0 lander, uh, what we are previously calling, calling uh, Series 2 lander for our Mission 3. And also we have an office in Europe, and sometimes they call it Luxembourg office. Uh, it's located in Luxembourg, and it has a relatively smaller number of people, 30 employees, but the office is also playing a very important role for our future uh, lunar exploration and developing the micro rover for lunar exploration for mission two, and of course for the future missions as well. So, and today I would really talk about, I want to talk about mission one. So that is our first mission, uh, which was launched December 11th uh, last year. And those are the pictures from uh, those launch. And look at how beautiful it is. So this beautiful picture of the Earth was actually taken by one of our customer payload camera. So then when it comes to the payloads, of course the mission one uh, didn't go to the moon just empty handed, but we also went there together with a lot of payloads. And mission one had several payloads from government and commercial, and uh, we, our payload service doesn't just consist of bringing something to the moon, but also at the same time, uh, we uh, communicate and coordinate with those customers to integrate each payload into its lander and its systems. Okay, and then, by the way, this is a picture of me in the mission control center. And then this green mascot here is, is a little Godzilla. And uh, it is actually sitting in my system console in the mission control room and uh, watching the entire mission one. And from some, some point, it became our guardian of the mission. And then, uh, so M1 was really a mission of first. So uh, it is a mission of first privately founded a commercial mission to reach the moon. And it's also the first entirely privately designed uh, lunar lander. And it is also the first mission that, oh, sorry, first commercial mission that reached 1.4 million uh, kilometer from the Earth. So we are very proud of those achievements. And here then I would like to show you the video of our mission one launch. Ignition. The iSpace Series One lunar lander is now its way towards the moon. Okay, uh, thank you very much. That was a short video, but I want to continue to... Okay, thank you. So I want to continue to talk about how the mission one went. 
So we set up those 10 uh, milestones, 10 success criteria. Then we have con successfully completed the launch and the separation of the vehicle, and we also successfully completed the establishment of a stable operation state. So attitude control, power, communication, all well established. And we also completed all the scheduled orbital control maneuvers. And we also successfully completed the 4.5 months of uh, deep space flight. And we also com successfully completed the lunar, uh, lunar, orbit, lunar orbit insertion maneuvers. So we finally achieved to get to the moon and came to the low lunar orbit of 100 kilometer altitude from the surface. But unfortunately, as you know, we could not complete success nine and 10. Uh, and then we're gonna talk more about it. But um, I really want to emphasize that achieving eight milestones out of 10 are still really great achievements that greatly contributes to our ongoing missions, and we take account in those lessons learned from each phase of the mission one to the next missions, mission two and three, that we are actively pushing forward at the moment. Okay, then I now tell you guys what the overview of the mission one, and I want to introduce my teammate who actually served as a, one of the flight directors in mission one and watched entire operation in the mission one. And she is going to talk about what's really what's happening behind the operation. And she can talk about her story now. So please welcome Janelle. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Hitachi-san. Thanks for the introduction. Just like he said, I served as one of the flight directors of our very first mission to the moon. And it's an experience I will never forget, and that today I would like to bring you behind the scenes so that you can experience it just like me and my team did. So let's just start from the beginning here, which is where we were, a team that was actually separated. So back when I joined iSpace in 2022, early 2022, the borders of Japan were actually closed. And that meant that me and many of my colleagues were calling in to the Hakuto-R Mission Control Center virtually because we were separated from distance, by distance, by country, and by time. So in this actual picture here, we were finishing up one of our simulations, prepping for our launch happening just later at the end of that year. And I'm not ever gonna forget this because in this virtual call, I'm calling in from Houston, Texas, where I was living with my parents, waiting for Japan to open their borders so I could go and join the team. I had to keep my voice down. My parents were literally sleeping in the next room over. And this was a hard thing to do because it was exciting getting to see everything we worked for coming together in this kind of moment, in this kind of simulation. And then it happened, Japan's borders opened. And as soon as I heard that, I ran down to my embassy, filled out all the paperwork, and about exactly one month later, I found myself in Japan, finally, becoming a team united. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a good picture of our team. It's not necessarily everyone, but it's pretty close to it. And when I say a team united, I really mean it. Because when we were calling in from all over the world, I mean, just looking at the faces you see on the screen here, we have representation from all over. I mean, I see Israel, I see Belgium, I see Spain, England, Hong Kong, Japan, of course, America, that's me, India, Thailand, we really came from all over. And you may be thinking, how can a team that's so diverse really be able to work together? You know, you just got, you were only able to come together now. And I'm talking six, seven months before our first mission ever launched. 
But our backgrounds coming from Lockheed Martin, coming from JAXA, coming from NASA, coming from ESA, they really did bring us together. Those differing experiences united us into one goal, and that was to, to land on the moon. Now, not only were we a team that finally were able to work together physically in one place, but we became a team that was dedicated. And this happened because, well, our trajectory to the moon was a low energy transfer orbit. And what that meant is we had four and a half months of operating our lander every single day, holidays, weekends, nights, mornings, you name it, we could find ourselves, at least a couple, in the Mission Control Center. And during all of this, I was taking pictures to kind of document our experience. Here you can see a couple of them. There's a Christmas tree in one, and that's because, yes, we were in the Mission Control Center during Christmas. We were there in the middle of the night. I slept on the couch quite a few times to make it through. And I'll also tell you this, I'm not that proud of these pictures because my hair doesn't look the best and I was a little bit tired. And I can tell you, I stopped cooking for myself. I was relying on Uber Eats for everything. And the most exercise that I got on a day-to-day -day basis was walking from the train to my house and walking from my house to the train. So I'm not going to say it was easy because it wasn't. This took dedication. Our entire lives were dedicated to this mission. But honestly, we loved it. <laughs> we loved it because it meant that every day after work, when we were going home on that walk to your house, you could look up at the sky and you can point to it and know that that's where our dreams were. We were going to the moon. I'm just gonna take you on a journey through a day in the life of one of us, space flight operations engineers. And some of you in the audience, you may be in mission operations yourself, so this is familiar to you. Our job as spacecraft operators is to know our lander. It's our job to command and instruct the lander to do very specific tasks so that we can re our, reach our mission goals. And it's also our job to, on a day-to-day -day basis, assess the health and safety of our lander to make sure all systems are performing as they should. And this is a job that requires vigilance. It's a job that requires close attention to detail. I really wish that we had a little selfie stick on our lander that we could look at at any time of the day, but that just wasn't the case. What you had instead is what you see on the screen. You had plots, you had graphs, you had data points, temperatures, voltages, and you needed to be able to interpret this data in a way that was meaningful and told a story so that you understand what's going on. Now, spacecraft operations, if you're in it, is supposed to be boring, but we didn't gather here today at IAC to talk about boring space missions because the very nature of what we do is challenging. And we do it because it's challenging. So we went into our maiden mission knowing that there would be uncertainty, knowing that there would be unknowns. And we knew we needed to be prepared to face those unknowns as well. And so we had a plan to rely on logic and to not be reactionary when an issue did pop its head into our daily operations. And it started with what we called a rainbow sheet that had a red, yellow, and a green column. And this is where it began, where you triage any problem that you have so that you can determine very quickly if the response required needs to be immediate or if it can wait till next week or the next day. After you triage your issue, you have to determine if the spacecraft needs to be put in a safe state. This is also something that we did in real time and were able to complete. Next, we needed to investigate. This is where the fun starts because it's where you find the root cause of your issues. We would bring in, or they might be with us here in the control room, our subject matter experts, whether that be prop or avio or guido. The people who helped design and build this lander were always by our side. 
And once we got them the data that they needed, we would bring them together so we could discuss a plan of action. How do we recover from here? And after we get that plan, we were able to simulate it. And after the simulations were complete and we were confident in our answer, we could go ahead and execute. Looking at those results, we now knew if we needed to go back and reiterate again, or we have succeeded and are now able to move forward with lessons learned, which we gained so many of in the four and a half months of operating this spacecraft. So I talked about the process, and the reality was is that we put it to good use. We were very, very excellent problem solvers, and it became apparent actually very early on in the mission I'm going to share with you one instance where this team really did the amazing thing that enabled us to continue on with the mission and grant us a chance to go for landing. This was right after we launched. Right after we launched, we, my team, is in the Hakuta R Mission Control Center. Now, about half of us are actually in the room, and the other half, including me, was actually at home. And that's because we had to work in shifts. Uh, you saw the picture of our team. There wasn't a lot of us, actually. <laughs> there was quite few, which meant that we had to use the resources that we had wisely. So we had our first shift in the mission control room watching the live stream of SpaceX launching us from Cape Canaveral. And I remember watching along at home in anticipation. I mean, if you've ever had a space mission and you are watching that rocket go off with your space mission, you know how it feels. Your heart is beating. I mean, it's beating about as fast as my heart was when I was waiting to come up on stage. <laughs> and I'm telling you that when it's out of your hands, it almost feels like you're going crazy. You just want to know the end result. And there I was on my couch watching, just like everyone else, to know the end result. Where are we going to turn on? Would our automatic sequence begin? This is step one to being able to get to your landing on the moon. And as I watched the live stream, I saw that our Hakuto R lander had begun its sequence. The landing gear began to deploy. You can actually see it in this picture here. My colleagues, my teammates, they're holding a paper model of our lander, and those little legs, they popped out. One, two, three, four. And I cried when I saw that. I mean, I couldn't believe it. It's like all this hard work. It was worth it. We turned on. And after I saw that, I went to bed. <laughs> so, okay. It's up to them now. I'm going to go to bed. I'm going to be well rested because my crew is in charge of doing the first burn, our first maneuver. But back in the Hakuto R Mission Control Center, it was a different story. And that's because after they saw that our spacecraft had separated successfully from the rocket, they shut the live stream off. So they never knew that the legs had begun to deploy. Instead, they were looking at their screens, those colorful screens of data, the telemetry, and they were waiting for that packet to arrive. And that packet did not arrive at the expected time. So you can imagine now that that crew in that room was nervous, because what are you going to do? Our partners, our ground stations with East Track, they were doing all they could do. We were looking for our lander, it should be there, and we just waited and they waited and they waited. And then finally, they got that packet. And when they got that packet, it was great, but it was also scary because that packet showed that our guidance, navigation, and control sensors, they were not in the expected configuration. And because of that, our attitude, also not in the expected configuration. And for a mission like ours, what that meant was that the timer was ticking. Because if our attitude is not getting sun to our solar panels, that means the battery is draining. And once it's done, it's done. So they were on a clock, and they had to work, and they had to work fast. And our team did exactly that. They troubleshot. They used that process. They did a process of elimination. They found the root cause of the problem. They recovered our attitude. And when I came in on the next shift, 
I was so happy to see that we had screens and we had data. They literally saved the mission. Incredible. And I mean, you don't forget things like this. You really don't. And it just goes to show that a team like ours could come together and solve anything that was thrown at us. And this is that moment, the culmination, the hugs, the, we finally did it, we finally. I can't believe I slept through all of this. <laughs> but I'm so glad they got to experience it. And all of this really just led to us having time to master our spacecraft. I mean, it's a really good feeling to know you come into work every day, and every day you put in, you get something out of it. We were learning the ins and outs of our lander. I mean, it's one thing to do simulations. It's one thing to do tests on the ground. It's one thing to do rehearsals. But it's entirely different to fly this thing in space for the very first time and see exactly how the spacecraft and its software and its hardware respond to real life circumstances. And I feel like this was highlighted when we were doing and performing our maneuvers. This is our meeting room right here. I think we just named it something, the Mission Control Cafe, because everyone comes in here to get their coffee. And so we would come into this meeting room to discuss all of the upcoming plans for the maneuver. As a flight director, it was my job to hear everybody's reports and then to confirm that every subsystem in the room was a go for the burn. And at this point, our focus was on what was our delta V, how long would we burn for, and what was our altitude at the time, and how long would we be in it. All of this was going to tell us about the coverage for our antennas, the availability of our guidance, navigation, and control sensors. It's going to tell us if any components are going to be thermally impacted. And it's also going to let us know if our flight dynamics looks good for the rest of the mission. Are we going to be able to perform the remaining maneuvers required of us? And this is the room where it happened. And we were able to complete seven maneuvers successfully. Seven. All seven of these were required in order to get us into the lunar orbit and also to give us a chance to go for landing on the moon. But our work was not just solving issues, preparing for these maneuvers and other activities. It was also things like this. Now this, this is my favorite picture from the entire mission. I'm sure I'm not the only one on the team who feels this way because just look at it, it's so unreal. I mean, I told you all earlier that we did not have a selfie stick on the lander. We did have cameras and they pointed out and they were our reminder that yes, we are in space and in this case, yes, we are at the moon. And there you can see that all of us are in this picture because that's our home planet. I remember because in the back room, one of my fellow flight directors was downloading the data from this image and he was processing it. And he yelled out, hey guys, hey guys, you gotta come back and see this. So of course I ran back there and I remember looking and saying, oh my God, like that's the moon and also, that's the Earth, but also what is that black like thing that's on the Earth in that bottom left corner? And then I found out it was a solar eclipse taking place over Australia. This is a one of a kind picture. That is so cool. <laughs> this is the coolest thing ever, honestly. And then we got this amazing video. I mean, this is what tells you that, yeah, you're at the moon and looking nadir, you can see its craters, the details. Like, this is real life. This is the, this is the culmination of our work. This is the result of it all. It's just a special thing to be operating something and getting to see the results of all your hard work just like this. And so now I want to bring you from the very beginning, we talked about the launch, all the way until now, our chance to go for landing on the moon. I mean, you see us all here in this room, and I was the flight director who was in charge of our landing operation. And I'll tell you now, it was the most difficult, challenging, and also the most interesting operation that I've ever been put in charge of in my entire career. 
And it was interesting for so many reasons. One, we had a lot of factors at play that we needed to contend with. When the world tuned into our live stream, you tuned in to the part where we were hands off. The hard work had been done and the lander was going to take off with its automated sequence and go for landing on its own. But what you may not have known is that the 16 hours prior to that beginning, it was my team who made it possible. So not only did we have to first give our spacecraft the best chance, give it the latest data on its location, position, velocity, but we also had to prepare as many contingencies as possible so that we gave ourselves a fair chance to go for landing. As part of this, we had to contend with eclipses that would drain our battery, and we also had to contend with occultations, which is a physical phenomenon where the moon was between us and the ground antennas on Earth and literally blacked us out from communications. So while all of this is going on and we're preparing for this big burn that's going to start our deceleration and get us on track to landing, we had to work in between calm windows to make sure all of our commands were executing as expected, all of our products got uploaded on time, and every system was green. Go for landing. It was a really intense process. It's not one that I'll ever forget, and it's one that we came into with a very positive outlook. You don't spend 135 days working your hardest just to doubt yourself in the end. It was quite the opposite. I don't know if there are any JPLers out there. I used to work for JPL, and I gave my team the lucky peanuts, and we each got to eat one because I knew this was going to be our day, and no matter what, we had done our best and gave ourselves the best shot. And so I'm going to hand it over to my coworker Hitachi-san to discuss the actual landing sequence. Okay, thank you, Janelle. And I would like to talk about this landing sequence. So the iSpace Mission 1 landing, landing sequence consists of six different phases. So in phase one, we start off from what we call D-orbit insertion, a DOI. So DOI is a very short burn of the main engine system to de-orbit the lander from the lunar, uh, low lunar orbit. And we're starting off from altitude of 100 kilometer. And after this burn, uh, this burn only t takes actually less than one minute, and it's a really, really short burn, but this uh, is a really f important first step of the entire landing sequence. And then it goes on to phase two. So in phase two, the lander closes so, and coasting. So the altitude drastically dropped from 100 kilometer to 25 kilometer at the end of the phase. And it, but it's still keeping a velocity because the main engine is kept inactive during the, this, this phase and only the attitude control thrusters are controlling the vehicle attitude during this phase. And it's also important to note that this phase uh, takes approximately 40 to 45 minutes. So the, the most of the time of the entire landing sequence is actually the coasting uh, phase. Then at the end of the phase, it finally reaches at 25 kilometer from the lunar surface. Then it, uh, the lander starts braking. So the lander now activates the main propulsion system again uh, to slow down the speed of the lander um, about from 6,000 kilometer per hour to 380 kilometer per hour. And also that the altitude also drops from 25 kilo kilometer to uh, three kilometer in this phase. And this is happening uh, approximately from the, the 30 minutes before the touchdown until two minutes before the touchdown. Mm -hmm. Then uh, phase four. So in phase four, the lander still keeps braking burn, but it assumes a vertical orientation of the altitude and to make the all the assist thrusters 
uh, point down to the lunar surface and to, to get prepared for the final uh, terminal uh, descent phase. So in this phase, velocity also drops from uh, around 380 km per hour to 120 km per hour. So it's now the change in the velocity from the kind of Shinkansen speed to the normal train kind of speed, normal rapid train speed, and altitude also now go, comes down to now the one ki just one, only the one kilometer from the lunar surface uh, during this phase. Then phase five, so this is the terminal descent phase, and at this moment, uh, the velocity now, the changing from 100, 100 kilometer per hour to only like 70 kilometer per hour, so it's now changing to like bicycle riding speed, and altitude is now uh, getting really close to the moon now. It's only 20 meters above the, the surface at the end of the phase. And the final phase that concludes the entire landing sequence is, of course, the terminal landing. And at this point now, the velocity is really at the working pace. And um, we shut down the, all the main engines, and we only rely on the assist thrusters to do the final adjustment and for the, for the soft, to perform the soft landing. Okay, so this is the landing phase. And the result of the landing, so as you know, um, so we could now complete uh, this success nine and also success 10, unfortunately. And the, all the findings of the anomalies that occurred during that phase are uh, publicly available and in the mission one final report that we publicly, uh, publicly Pub, uh, published in the press, uh, but uh, basically what happened is that the lander uh, completed all the process for deceleration and also reduced the speed to one meter per second. So it really came to the really end of the, the phase, but unfortunately the lander, when the lander reaches that one meter per second speed, the the uh, altitude was still um, approximately five kilometers from the, from the lunar surface. So it basically stopped there, uh, the lander thinking there is a surface there, but the actual surface is five kilometers below uh, at the lander. So then by continuing the terminal descent phase for the soft landing and just lander uh, consumes all the fuel and eventually uh, it ran out of the propellant and um, resulted in then the hard landing. Um, so those, um, so basically the, those findings revealed that the problem was on the software, not on the hardware side, but at the same time, uh, iSpace uh, was responsible for the program management that we basically changed the landing site after the landing complete that uh, resulted in its uh, unsuccessful landing. Uh, but anyway, uh, but uh, we are taking those, you know, the feedbacks into account and reflect them to the future missions. And by the way, one kind of lucky single, uh, fortunate thing in this unfortunate event is that we actually had all the telemetry data uh, during this phase, and that is a really precious source of the information that gave us, that gave us a lot of information and. By this data, we could reveal what happened, and we learned a lot from those data. So this was a really precious experience, and this is a really precious data that we got. Um, yes. <laughs> so then, okay. So then. Yeah, okay, then I want to welcome back, uh, welcome Janelle back to the stage again to complete our story. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hitachi-san, for that explanation. Back one, back one. Act like you didn't see that. Oh, oops, hit it again. 
I thought you didn't see that either. All right, we're good. Okay, so, I mean, as a flight director, as someone who's worked in mission operations for my entire career, I am a person who is always thinking of contingency plans to the point where it gets on my friend's nerves sometimes. But I will tell you that I did not have a contingency plan for this, this scenario. Like I said, I was so serious when I said that when I went into that room, I wanted me and my team to only think of success. There was only one outcome. And I really didn't know how I was going to react if it wasn't. And I was in the Hakuta R Mission Control Center with my teammates for quite a long time after we lost contact with Verlander. And I remember that journey home in the taxi. I remember getting to my house and I remember getting into my bed and feeling very numb. And for the first time, I decided to look at my phone and I saw the messages from my friends and I saw the messages from my family, and I saw the messages from the people in this room. And when I say that it, it really gave me strength that I didn't know I was going to need in that moment, I mean it. I really read everything. Even to this day, it makes me emotional. <laughs> <laughs> Your support really meant the world to me and my team. We really worked hard and we really gave it our all. So for you to reach out in the way that you did, I had no idea. I mean, we were in the mission control and the cameras were there, but in the moment, you don't even notice. You don't notice anything. I don't even think I've watched the full live stream myself. But this made it real to me, the fact that people from around the world supported us, and you really meant it. My colleagues, people I didn't even know were reaching out, and this was powerful. And I just want to give a shout out to Israel right now for their successful landing on the moon because everyone at iSpace watched that. <laughs> and we know how hard it is. So huge congratulations to you. We are so proud and we're waiting for everyone else's success too. And I don't want this to end on a sad note at all. That's not my intention. In fact, this is just chapter one. This is just the beginning. I mean, we're working on mission two right now as we speak. This is just the beginning of our journey and we have so much in store. Like Hitachi-san said, we are extremely lucky. We got so much data from mission one. Our people are our asset. We know our lander and we also know why our landing failed. These are crucial pieces of information, and it's also why I am confident going forward, and I'm looking forward to mission two, where we will land on the moon. So I'll hand it back over to Hitachi-san to close us out with our outlook to the future. Thank you very much, Janelle, and thank you very much to the audience. So we are moving forward from mission one. So I want to talk about mission two and beyond. So for mission two, it is now planned for 2024. So it's next year, so it's coming. And we are using the same Series 1 lander that iSpace Tokyo office is now developing. And we are also carrying a micro rover that is being developed by iSpace uh, Europe now. And also for Mission 3, iSpace US office is now developing Apex 1.0 lunar lander for Mission 3. So we recently announced that launch date for Mission 3 is now planned for 20, 
2026. And for this lander, we, are, we, can, we have the capability to carry the payload up to 300 kilograms, and we have a plan to increase it even up to 500 kilograms at the moment. So we are continuing to do those missions. So mission one was just a beginning, and mission two and mission three, and also we're planning for the future missions. So thank you very much for your support, and I'm really glad to be here today to talk about the ice space story, and, and I personally have my own story, Janelle has her own story, and everyone in ice space has his or her own story on mission one. So before mission one, we are just the group of persons who came to ice space under Akamera Sun's vision. But what happened after completing mission one is that we got the feeling that we completed one mission together, finally. Then we have a feeling that we are one team now who can do anything that we can do anything, and anything is possible. So that is a really great asset that we gain from mission one, and I'm really great, great to see. I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing what is going to happen to iSpace for the future. And I am also glad to be working at iSpace for those future missions. So again, thank you very much for your support, and thank you very much for coming here to hear us today. So thank you very much. <laughs> Seems like I forgot to go over the one last slide. <laughs> Anyway, so mission to find a mod, uh, flight model assembly has, has begun. This photo was taken in May 2023, this year. So we are already working on mission to flight model, and this is being assembled now in Japan. So it's really coming. It's really coming. So thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, so now I think we are going to take some questions from the audience. Hi, thank you very much for the, uh, you know, sharing with us the uh, great experience based on the uh, true story. And then I wish, you know, uh, everybody uh, share I um, feel the same kind of uh, the way we uh, felt uh, on the mission one. And then please, uh, you know, scan the QR code here to throw us some questions. We'd like to open up some Q&A session, maybe for the next five minutes or so. Okay, I got some. Can I start off the question? Yeah. So, how was the result of mission one changes the operation procedure at iSpace? Changes the operation procedure at iSpace. Okay, so yeah, mission one taught us a lot and we are absolutely going to learn, use everything that we learned from mission one and mission two 
First, for mission two, we are not starting from zero. We are starting from a lot of knowns. We know the quirks and we also are able to improve on them for our lander. And so this time around, we are basically doing everything we can to make our lives a whole lot easier. That means that our checklists, our procedures, our scripts, our tools, everything that we learn throughout the mission in every phase, design through decommissioning, we are going to take that into account when reiterating this time around. So we're saving a lot of time, which also gives us a lot of time to be able to capitalize on holding rehearsals that are meant to mimic as closely as possible what we are going to experience in flight. The more time that we have to prepare for the nominal, well actually the more time that we have to complete our nominal preparations, the more time we're going to have to basically test everything that can go wrong too. So we're going to be holding a lot of simulations that are just throwing stuff at the engineers. Stuff that the flight directors aren't going to know about, stuff that the subject matter experts or engineers aren't going to know about, to give us a chance to be able to use our anomaly resolution process and really be prepared for whatever's thrown our way. Thanks so much. Well, I'd like to go with this question. I think everybody want to ask this question. How do you face the challenge of losing over your hard work when everything feels low? How did you overcome the backlash? Overcome the backlash? Like, how, oh sure, I will repeat the question. Uh, we Let's go away. So how? <laughs> How do you overcome the backlash, you know, even though you did the hard work on your mission, right? And then... Um, I, I don't know if I had really the backlash, honestly speaking. Um, of course, at the, the day of the landing failure, I was actually on the live stream event, and I was not in the MCC. Janelle was in the MCC and watching the uh, how the, everything was going. And after we found out what happened, um, I couldn't really say the word at the moment, and I after all the event and we had several meetings and talking about the anomalies and after that I came back to the hotel then I just slept uh, <laughs> then I yeah honestly speaking I didn't really see this as a failure I mean of course on the day of that day I was sad and also I feel like I lost a lot of things but then at the same time, um, and I was alone at the hotel, then I feeling really sad. But then, after that, I came back to the MCC there, then seeing all the people there, um, including Janelle. And when I saw this, when when I met them, I feel like you know we. I was really proud to be at you know as proud to be as a member of that team and all the all the things that I, I was depressed that has certainly gone and and that is you know then I I really feel that we didn't lose anything and we it's just you know we can start it again then we learned a lot and we can start it again then now we have this great team. That is the feeling that I got when I saw those people working in the MCC. So I don't know if that answered your question, but that's my experience of that day. So yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, probably this will be the last question. Hold on a sec. Oh. 
Will the ice face um, lower of mission two cause any payroll? How far it is development? Uh, so mission two, as IOC explained, uh, it's going to be uh, next year launch. And then our payroll capacity about uh, up to 30 kilograms. And then we've already uh, secured the customer's payroll. Uh, the, the, the largest one is uh, a Japanese company uh, called Takasago Sama Engineering. Uh, they're going to uh, bring the uh, uh, experimental uh, device to divide water into hydrogen oxygen on the lunar surface. And then this is going to be very uh, important uh, well, experiment uh, for the future of the space resource utilization. And then also uh, we have other uh, payload uh, from the another uh, Japanese company to uh, test uh, well their, uh, how can I say, uh, the, the food production uh, system uh, on the uh, lunar surface, and also we have a component from the uh, Taiwanese uh, well, uh, university uh, to uh, test their uh, component uh, uh, during our flight and then on the surface. And then uh, mission two is uh, uh, well uh, fully manifested, and then we are looking for the uh, uh, pay, more payload for the our future missions, mission three, and then further missions. Thank you very much. Um, due to the uh, limited time, we need to uh, close the q and session uh, now on. But uh, we have a booth at the exhibition um, center. So please, uh, you know, come by to ask any questions you have. So I really want to have a microphone back to Hakamada-san for closing remarks. Thank you. Well, right after the uh, first Landing attempt in April. Uh, we hold a uh, all hands meeting internally at iSpace. And then, first things message I delivered uh, during the uh, all hands meeting is was we really become one team through this challenge. And then well, as Janera uh, explained, we, we are separated from at the beginning. And then uh, we started this uh, challenge uh, around six years ago. And only six years, uh, we achieved this great, great things together uh, from scratch. i really proud of my team. And then uh, technology is important. However, Everything is humans, people's going to do. And then, um, well, so people's determination, commitment, action change the story, history. And then uh, I like to tell, never quit the Luna Quest. We will continue. And then, um, I want to thank you, uh, Yoshi and then Janere, uh, today uh, share their story uh, that I think very ins inspirational. It's all about people. O it's all about the story behind the people. And then um, we will continue this journey. Thank you very much. <laughs> and then uh, at the end, uh, I have many team member, teammate today. So I'd like to ask everyone, iSpace team, come on stage.
Thank you very much.